So now you're displaying your ignorance on the matter. Every single, every single one. Listen closely. No, they don't. Listen, listen closely. No, they don't. Every single one of the. No, they don't. Hold on, hold on. Let me finish what I'm you saying. You can say it a thousand every times. Every single no, they one don't. of the eight. Thank you, James, and everyone with Modern Day Debate for hosting this soon-to-be legendary exchange. And a special thanks to Kenny for challenging me yet again to show why Muhammad most certainly is not the noble pattern of conduct the Quran says he is. Courage is a virtue, my friends, and what could be more courageous than Daniel Hakikachu and Kenny Bomer challenging Mike Jones and the Dizzle himself to repeatedly hit Islam in the most sensitive of all soft spots, the character of Muhammad. So hats off to these gentlemen for their fearless defense of their prophet. Before we get started, I have to ask, as always, are there any jihadis here who would like to stop me from saying what I'm about to say before I say it? Because this is going straight to the internet, folks. Once I've said what I'm about to say, it's permanent, like a Sharpie. Chopping my head off later won't magically erase everything I'm about to say. Indeed, chopping my head off later will only amplify what I'm about to say. So, better get to chopping before these truth bombs start a dropping. No one? Well, we can only, we can only conclude that everything I'm about to say has the stamp of approval of jihadis everywhere. Was Muhammad's marriage to Aisha immoral? If you're new to this topic, here's the problem in a nutshell. According to Islam's most trusted sources, Muhammad, the prophet of, the prophet of Islam, married a girl who was six or seven years old, and he consummated the marriage with her when she was nine years old. Muhammad, the pattern of conduct for Muslims, was 54 years old when he had sex with a prepubescent nine-year-old girl. Was that ethical? Was that moral? Was that the sort of thing a divinely ordained pattern of conduct should have done? Was that the example Muhammad should have set for his followers? Here we are having this debate in the 21st century because Islam. Now, there are several different ways to react to Muhammad's marriage to Aisha. Muslims generally go in one of two directions on this issue. Some Muslims will say, Muhammad is our pattern of conduct, so if he had sex with a nine-year-old girl, there must not really be anything wrong with having sex with a nine-year-old girl. These Muslims then defend the ethics of child marriage, which we just saw in the previous debate. Other Muslims will say, Muhammad is our pattern of conduct, but having sex with a nine-year-old girl is clearly wrong, so he must not have actually done it. These Muslims will then attack the credibility and reliability of their own sources in order, in order to attempt to show that Aisha was older than nine when Muhammad had sex with her. Non-Muslims have a range of possible responses. On one end of the spectrum, there are moral relativists who say, who are we to judge someone from a different time and a different culture? And on the other end of the spectrum, we have people who think that Muhammad was a disgusting pervert. They'll say, Muhammad was a fiend. An obscene fiend. An obscene fiend flirting with a preteen. That obscene fiend made a preteen scream. This is a harsh but understandable response to the issue. Our job in this debate is to present our perspectives and more importantly, our reasons for our perspectives so that everyone will be in a better position to make an informed decision about Muhammad's relationship with Aisha. So, was Muhammad's marriage to Aisha immoral? Not surprisingly, the Quran, the collection of revelations received by the man who married the prepubescent girl, says, no, it was absolutely fine. According to Surah 65, verse 4 of the Quran, a Muslim man can marry, have sex with, and divorce a girl before she's reached puberty. In Surah 65, verse 4 of the Quran, 
Allah gives rules for divorcing women and girls who don't have a monthly menstrual cycle. Earlier in the Quran, Allah had declared that if a man divorces a woman, there's a waiting period called the idda, before the woman can get married again. The waiting period was three monthly menstrual cycles. But Muhammad's followers eventually asked him, what about women and girls who don't have a monthly menstrual cycle? Either because they're too old, or because they're too young, or because they're too pregnant. And Allah answers this question in Surah 65, verse 4 of the Quran. He says that if a man divorces a girl who's too young for a monthly menstrual cycle, a girl who hasn't reached puberty, the girl has to wait three months before she marries another man. Not three menstrual cycles, the girl doesn't have a menstrual cycle yet. She has to wait three months instead. So according to the Quran, um, a man can marry a prepubescent girl, then have sex with her, then divorce her, then pass her on to the next man who can marry her after waiting three months, then have sex with her, then divorce her, all before the girl has ever reached puberty. But don't take my word for it. Let's read Surah 65, verse 4 of the Quran. This is the study Quran. As for those of your women who no longer await menstruation, if you are unsure, then their waiting period is three months, as it is for those who are yet to menstruate. But as for those who are pregnant, their term is until they deliver, and whosoever reverences God, he will appoint, uh, he will appoint ease for his affair. I went ahead and quoted the entire verse, but the relevant portion for this debate is their waiting period is three months as it is for those who are yet to menstruate. This is about girls who haven't started menstruating. Just so there's no confusion about this verse, let's read a few classical Muslim commentaries and a modern commentary so that you don't think uh, D. Wood is just making this stuff up. This is the tafsir of Ibn Kathir, Muhammad's companion and cousin. Ibn Kathir comments, and for such of your women as despair of menstruation because of old age, if you doubt about their waiting period, their period of waiting shall be three months. Upon which another man asked, O messenger of Allah, what about the waiting period of those who do not have menstruation because they are too young? Along with those who have it not because of young age, their waiting period is three months. Ibn Abbas gives the historical background. Someone was actually asking about remarrying a prepubescent girl who's already been divorced. So according to, the, to Ibn Abbas, at least part of Surah 65 verse 4 is responding to this question about what, how long do we wait when we marry a prepubescent girl after she's been divorced? And then the Quran says, well, since she, she hasn't started menstruating yet, just wait three months instead. This is the tafsir of Ibn Kathir, considered by many to be the greatest tafsir of all time, but Ibn Kathir is one of the most respected Muslim scholars of all time. After mentioning the three-month waiting period for a woman in menopause, Ibn Kathir writes, the same for the young who have not reached the years of menstruation. Their idda is three months like those in menopause. So three months like those in menopause for those who are too young to menstruate. This is Tafsir Jalalain, certainly one of the most popular and respected Quran commentaries of all time. In the case of those of your wives who are past the age of menstruation, if you have any doubt about their idda, their idda should be three months. And that also applies to those who have not yet menstruated because of their youth. Those are classic Muslim commentaries. We can go through a lot more. But I wanted to go through a modern Muslim commentary. Uh, this is uh, Maududi's The Meaning of the Quran. Maududi comments on this verse. 
making mention of the waiting period for the girls who have not yet menstruated clearly proves it is not only permissible to give away the girl in marriage at this age, but it is also permissible for the husband to consummate marriage with her. Now, obviously, no Muslim has the right to forbid a thing which the Quran has held as permissible. Thanks for quoting, thanks for giving us the meaning of the Quran, Mauduti. And in case that's not enough for a new generation of Muslims who uh, prefer listening to their favorite YouTube da'i rather than Islam's greatest scholars of all time, Muhammad Hijab, the amazing Muhammad Hijab, posted on his YouTube channel uh, what he thinks about Surah 65 verse 4. He said, and I quote, if you look just at the Quran, you will get the indication that you can have sexual intercourse with a five-year-old. His words, not mine. Hijab quotes Surah 65, verse 4 of the Quran as his proof text. He says that according to Surah 65, verse 4, sex with a five-year-old girl is halal. He says that the verse specifically refers to marrying and divorcing prepubescent girls, and he says there's no way around it. Now, to be clear, Muhammad Hijab doesn't believe it's okay to have sex with a five-year-old girl because of Muhammad's example in the Hadith. Muhammad waited until Aisha was nine. But Hijab correctly admits what the Quran plainly declares, namely that sex with prepubescent girls is 100% halal certified. And the prophet of Islam was a shining example of Surah 65, verse 4, in action. We find Muhammad's favorite pickup line in Sahih al-Bukhari, Islam's most trusted source on the life of Muhammad, 51.25. Narrated Aisha, Allah's messenger said to me, you were shown to me in a dream. An angel brought you to me, wrapped in a piece of silken cloth, and said to me, this is your wife. I removed the piece of cloth from your face, and there you were. I said to myself, if it is from Allah, then it will surely be accomplished. So, a man in his 50s had a dream about an angel giving him a six or seven year old girl as his wife. And instead of going to a psychiatrist, he went to the little girl and said, baby, I had a dream. I had a dream about you. An angel wrapped you up, gave you to me as a present. Even though you're a kid and I'm 52, just a few pages later, Bukhari comments, uh, connects Surah 65 verse four to Muhammad's marriage to Aisha. The chapter heading in this passage of Bukhari is giving one's young children in marriage is permissible. Giving one's young children in marriage is permissible. By virtue of the statement of Allah, and for those who have no monthly courses, i.e. they are still immature, it's quoting the Quran there, Surah 65 verse four, the idda for the girl before puberty, before puberty, before puberty is three months in the above verse, citing the Quran. And then Bukhari gives the example of marrying a prepubescent girl in context, Sahih al-Bukhari, 5133. Sahih al-Bukhari, 5133. Narrated Aisha, that the Prophet wrote the marriage contract with her when she was six years old, and he consummated his marriage when she was nine years old, and then she remained with him for nine years, i.e. till his death. How old was she when Muhammad consummate, consummated the marriage? Nine years old. We get more details about the engagement and marriage yeah. in Sahih al-Bukhari,
3894, narrated Aisha, my marriage contract with the prophet was written when I was a girl of six years. We came to Al Medina and we dismounted at the place of Bani al Harith bin al Khazraj. Then I got ill and my hair fell down. Later on, my hair grew again, and my mother, Umm Rahman, came to me while I was playing in a swing with some of my girlfriends. She called me and I went to her, not knowing what she wanted to do to me. She caught me by the hand and made me stand at the door of the house. I was breathless then, and when my breathing became normal, she took some water and rubbed my face and hands with it. Then she took me into the house. There in the house, I saw some Ansari women who said, best wishes and Allah's blessing and a good luck. Then she entrusted me to them and they prepared me for the marriage. Unexpectedly, Allah's messenger came to me in the forenoon and my mother handed me over to him. And at that time, I was a girl of nine years old. Imagine the scene. Little girl on a swing. Little Aisha. Girl needs a babysitter. Playing on her little swing. And Muhammad climbed on top of her. There are a lot more passages like this in Bukhari, but we find the same thing over and over again. So we'll go, just go through some examples. Sahih Muslim. Sahih Muslim 3481. It was narrated from Aisha that the Prophet married her when she was seven years old, and she was taken to him as a bride when she was nine years old, and she took her dolls with her. He died when she was 18 years old. How old was she? Nine years old. Sex at nine. It's not very noble. Sunan Abu Daud. Twenty-one, twenty-one. Aisha narrated, the Messenger of Allah married me while I was a girl of seven years. Suleiman, one of the narrators, said, or six. And he consummated the marriage when I was a girl of nine. How old was she? Nine years old. Sunan An Nasai. Thirty-three eighty. It was narrated that Aisha said, the messenger of Allah married me when I was six and consummated the marriage with me when I was nine and I used to play with dolls. Girl was six when he began the betrothal. But she was too small. So Muhammad waited. How old was she? At the consummation? Nine years old. Still playing with the doll. Sunan ibn Majah, 1877. It was narrated that Abdullah said, the prophet married Aisha when she was seven years old and consummated the marriage with her when she was nine, and he passed away when she was 18. Muhammad, this is the man that Allah chose as the pattern of conduct for Muslims. He saw a little girl and said, give me that body. How old was she? Nine years old. Oh, look, there's a footnote here. The marriage bond of a girl who is not yet an adult, i.e. has not reached the age of puberty, is perfectly valid in Islam. Wonder where they got that idea. Hint, Prophet Mo. Sunan Ibn Majah, 1982. It was narrated that Aisha said, I used to play with dolls when I was with the Messenger of Allah, and he used to bring my friends to me to play with me. Have you noticed all the references to dolls? Aisha always got her dolls with her. As it turns out, saying 
a girl was still playing with dolls was the Islamic way of saying that the girl hadn't reached puberty. We can see this in Bukhari. Bukhari includes some parenthetical commentary from Ibn Hajar al Asqalani, considered the greatest Hadith scholar of all time. Bukhari, 6130. Narrated Aisha, I used to play with the dolls in the presence of the Prophet, and my girlfriends also used to play with me. When Allah's Messenger used to enter my dwelling place, they used to hide themselves, but the Prophet would call them to join and play with me. The playing with dolls and similar images is forbidden. But it was allowed for Aisha at that time as she was a little girl, not yet reached the age of puberty. Did you catch that? Not yet reached the age of puberty. Not only did Muhammad like to watch Aisha playing with her little friends, he also liked to, play, liked to watch her playing with dolls. Dolls are images. Images are forbidden in Islam. So why was Aisha allowed to continue playing with dolls? Passage tells us she was a little girl, not yet reached the age of puberty. Not according to me, according to Islam's most trusted sources, Henry's puberty. We can sum up the testimony of the Hadith with a passage from Ibn Kathir, his four volume biography of Muhammad. Ibn Kathir writes after quoting, so in his four volume commentary, uh, he eventually quotes Urwa ibn al Zubair, that's Aisha's nephew, who says that Aisha was nine when Muhammad consummated the marriage. Then, after quoting Urwa on the age of Aisha, Ibn Kathir says this His statement, he contracted marriage with Aisha when she was six, thereafter, consummating marriage with her when she was nine is not disputed by anyone and is well established in the, in the Sahih collections of traditions and elsewhere. When scholars disagreed on some topic, Ibn Kathir would point it out. He would draw attention to the disagreements. On this issue, he specifically says, no one disagrees on this. How old was she? Nine years old. So, how do our Muslim friends respond? Well, we're going to hand this over to Kenny now. I have some idea of some of the responses, but we'll see where Kenny goes with this. <laughs> Thank you very much. We'll kick it over to Kenny for his 23-minute opening statement as well. Kenny, oh. the floor is all yours. Okay, uh, Mr. Mr. Moderator, before we uh, start the time, I'd like to say that I want to acknowledge that uh, David Wood, his son, recently passed away, so my condolences go to him on that. I do bear witness that there's no God other than Allah, and I bear witness that Muhammad is his final servant, the seal of our prophets. I would like to thank James and everyone with Modern Day Debate for uh, organizing this and inviting me once again. And because David Wood, because David Wood is known to have cross-dressed a few times, a time or two, uh, I would like to give him as a token of uh, our debate relationship, a uh, copy of my most recent book, Your Right to Self-Identify, My Right to Disagree, Who is Oppressing Whom? So, so with that being said, uh, Mr. Moderator, I'll go ahead and start my time. So was Muhammad's marriage to Aitha, Aisha, rather, alhamdulillah, ethical, peace and blessing be upon them both? What we should be asking ourselves is how can a religiously valid marriage be anything but ethical? And I'd like the world to remember this, if nothing else, throughout the course of this debate. There's no written record of anyone accusing the Prophet, peace be upon him, of any wrongdoing, and no one claiming that this marriage was unethical before the year 1905. This is strictly a, a slander produced in modern times. And fortunately, in opening my argument, I have a, quote, a quotation by someone whose words will be accepted even by my opponent. Even David Wood, I have to agree with this. This is a quote by a non-expert on religious matters uh, in, a re in a recent video published this very year, just last month, March 2023. 
And in that topic, uh, that, that uh, topic of that video, the person was discussing two hadith in particular that relate to Aisha's age at quote unquote consummation. The person says, and I quote, we have all kinds of reasons for believing Aisha had not reached puberty according to the Muslim sources. But there are some hadiths that Muslim use in the West to show that Aisha had in fact reached puberty. Well now I am just confused everyone. I mean it looked like we had good evidence that Aisha had reached puberty, that she had started menstruating when taken to Muhammad to quote unquote consummate the marriage. And there are Muslims all over the world who use this hadith to show that Aisha had in fact reached puberty. But I look at a different translation of the exact same hadith and it doesn't say one word about Aisha menstruating. So now I am just confused. I don't know what to believe here. I don't speak Arabic. And so who was that person in that recent video? It was none other than David Wood himself. And in that recent video, David Wood was acknowledging contradictions within the Hadith that caused him so much confusion. He said, I don't know what to believe. So, so let's remember that as we proceed and we talk about his double standards. So allow me to lay the foundation of my argument in this debate by rehashing a few things from the previous debate. During that debate, I, I presented evidence to establish reasonable doubt. My argument was based on conflicting evidence that's produced conflicting theories amongst modern and classical scholars, both Muslim and non-Muslim alike. And my argument was based on the same type of conflicting evidence that David Wood has admitted to being so confused by. He admitted to being confused because conflicting evidence means there's reason for uncertainty, skepticism, confusion that he's admitted to, and this therefore reasonable doubt. So we should ask ourselves, does an honest jury in modern times convict people when evidence produces skepticism uh, and, and confusion and uh, uncertainty? And, you know, no, it doesn't, they're not supposed to. A jury in modern times is instructed to presume the accused innocent unless, evident, unless guilt is clear beyond a reasonable doubt. But even in the admitted confusion of David Wood, he chooses to accuse and convict Muhammad, peace be upon him, by relying on the opinions of some classical scholars while ignoring other classical scholars who have rejected what has been proven to be questionable and fabricated hadith. He also attempts to discredit the in-depth research of modern scholars by claiming that they are somehow looking for excuses because they are ashamed of the prophet, peace be upon him. However, I haven't heard any of them say that, uh, so I'm not sure exactly where he drew those conclusions from. But the reality is modern scholars have the luxury of using modern technology uh, to look at all the evidence presented, which was a, a luxury that wasn't necessarily afforded to classical scholars of Hadith. But by using gross double standards, David Wood uses modern accusations that once again did not exist before 1905 to accuse the prophet, peace be upon him, but refuses to accept the modern scholarship that's used to defend him. And that in fact is a double standard. So however, let's, let's make it clear that I don't, I don't need to solely rely on modern scholarship because as I'll demonstrate in due course, uh, there was disagreement about the reliability of the age of Aisha, quote unquote, consummation hadith, even amongst classical scholars of hadith many of whom who knew the primary source of those hadith, Hisham ibn Urwa, and rejected the hadith in question, deeming them to be unreliable. Hisham ibn Urwa uh, died in the eighth century, but hadith didn't start being classified as sahih, meaning reliable, or da'if, meaning unreliable, until the ninth century. But, you know, why do I say David Wood uses modern accusations? I say that because the first person on record making this unwarranted, uh, unwarranted accusation was uh, an English scholar of Oxford University, another David, lo and behold, uh, named David uh, Margaluth in his work, Muhammad and the Rise of Islam, published in 1905. And this is why Dr. Jonathan Brown, by example, says in his book, Muhammad, A Short Introduction, he says, and I quote, interestingly, no critic of, no critic of Muhammad, from his fiercest opponents in the Quraysh to medieval Christian clerics, uh, objected to his marriage to Aisha until the modern period. So for all of that time, up until 1905, everyone thought that this marriage was perfectly ethical. So ask yourself, do, is it intellectually honest and morally acceptable to accuse someone of wrongdoing when the evidence against them is debatable? What makes something debatable? Merriam-Webster says it's something open to dispute, something capable of being debated, something open to interpretation. Cambridge says it's something that's not clear or certain because different people hold different opinions. So regarding the opinions of classical scholars of Hadith, versus modern scholars of Hadith. Yes, it's true again that some classical scholars of Hadith such as Ibn Kathir and a few of his contemporaries said that there was consensus of agreement about Aisha's age at quote unquote consummation. Uh, but what does this word consummation mean? And we're gonna address that here shortly uh, later in the debate. The fact is 
Those early scholars were relying on what's been proven to be questionable and fabricated hadith, with the common link, Hisham ibn Urwa, as the original, original primary source, and he and his students were of the Al Shafi school of thought in Islamic jurisprudence, which originated in Iraq and was the only school of thought to have endorsed child marriage. So those early scholars were also, and, and those, those people were also repeating one another on the issue in a similar way that David Wood, by example, repeats and uses the works of Sham Shimon from the Answering Islam website. And as we've seen in our current political environment, when lies are repeated often enough, they become facts in the minds of uneducated and gullible people. So during the previous debate, I clearly stated that I wasn't there to debate hadith. What I did argue without the need to take time to break down multiple hadith, because it's very time consuming, are the, very, uh, are the conflicting views that classical and modern scholars have held about them. Conflicting views exist because the evidence is debatable. Facts aren't debatable. People don't debate about whether or not fire is hot. But they do and always have for centuries debated about these hadith in particular uh, that, that are in question here today. But so the, the, there must be standards to go by. And I'm saying all this as a, as a Sunni Muslim who believes in the sciences of the hadith, but I also believe in using fair objective standards when studying and drawing conclusions from them. So allow me to make a point. When lawyers present evidence in court, they often bring in expert witnesses in forensics, by example. The lawyers themselves don't break down the specifics about forensics. They have the experts do it, and in turn, the lawyers give an overview of those findings of those experts via bullet points to either confirm the evidence or to establish reasonable doubt. And that's what I did in the previous debate by mentioning 10 books by Muslim and non-Muslim scholars and articles by many others whose findings about the age of Aisha differed. They all opine different ages from, yes, as earliest nine years old to as old as 21, and I didn't come up with those numbers. The experts did and I simply gave an honest representation of those findings. Uh, and again, there are Muslim and non-Muslim scholars and historians who have studied and analyzed these, these works in depth and the works of previous scholars. So keep in mind that during this debate, I'm gonna mention the works of non-Muslim scholars, and I'll tell you why, as, along with Muslim scholars. And I mention non-Muslim scholars because they have no dog in the fight. They, they give their opinions and they can't be accused of making excuses and being ashamed of Muhammad, peace be upon him, like David Wood likes to accuse the Muslim scholars of, as we have seen here today. And so like expert witnesses in a court case, when scholars who have studied the age of Aisha, quote unquote, consummation hadith in depth, when they come to various conclusions, they do so because the evidence is again conflicting. And when experts give conflicting statements in a, in a, in a trial, um, an honest person would only conclude that there's no way to convict the accused because the evidence is, again, debatable based on conflicting views of the experts that may cause doubt and, yes, the confusion that David Wood has admitted to in his recent video. So there must be standards to go by, not the double standards of a person like David Wood, but fair, objective standards. So addressing the principles of Hadith standards and their acceptance with the Institute of Islamic Jurisprudence on the Dar Lefthai website, principle number three says clearly, Scholars can disagree about the authenticity of a particular hadith. They say, and I quote, since classifying hadiths is based on the independent research of each scholar, sometimes we find mixed opinions of expert scholars regarding the authenticity of a particular narrator or hadith. They say, remember that when a scholar says that a hadith is sahih, meaning reliable, or da'if, meaning unreliable, it's not a factual statement. It's merely his personal opinion based on his independent research at, in his time. Principle number four says a sahi or reliable hadith may also be, be considered da'if or unreliable in later times. They say the following, and I quote, and this may be hard for even some Muslims to hear, but they say, and I quote, at times it is possible that an earlier scholar finds a particular hadith to be completely authentic when it reaches him through the, companion, the companions of the prophet, meaning the sahaba, and those succeeding them, the tabi'un. And however, they say, a weakness in the chain of narration could have appeared as it progresses that past that imam. And in such an instance, it would be wrong to accuse the earlier imam of using a weak hadith if it was perceivably sahih, meaning reliable in his time, but da'if or unreliable uh, after that later on. Therefore, they say, a hadith which was regarded as da'if in imam, imam Bukhari's time, for example, was not necessarily as such at the time of the earlier scholars. And the same applies in current times for a hadith that Imam Bukhari would have listed as sahih or reliable, uh, then after further scrutiny is found to be unreliable, which is the case with the age of Aisha, quote unquote, consummation hadith under question here today. Principle number five says, 
how, they're answering the question, how authentic is a, a Sahih Hadith? And do we leave, uh, okay, so how authentic is a Sahih Hadith? They say the following, and I quote, Imam Ibn al-Salah, the renowned Hadith expert, states in his Muqaddimah that just because a Hadith is given the status of being Sahih or reliable does not necessitate that in actual fact it is undeniably Sahih or reliable. It merely means that from a technical aspect, in terms of fulfilling the five conditions of collecting the hadith, that the, the, the hadith is sahih and there will, therefore will most likely be sahih in actual terms as well. But they say, however, there remains a possibility that even a hadith considered as sahih may not actually be as such, since a reliable narrator can make mistakes. But they say, but the possibility is not given any credit unless there are indications and strong proofs elsewhere, such as a hadith opposing a clear Quranic verse or the more authentic hadiths. And in both of these cases, David Wood's gonna find out here in a moment, uh, th these hadith in question fall into both of these categories. And they say, if these strong proofs are found, it's perfectly acceptable not to act upon or accept those sahih or so-called reliable hadith. So let's keep those principles in mind while considering the views of the following uh, scholar of hadith. In October 2022, Dr. Joshua Little, Ironically, also of Oxford University, was, uh, wrote an article titled, Why I Studied the Aisha Hadith, while discussing his dissertation on this topic. And Dr. Little is a non-Muslim scholar of Hadith with no dog in the fight, and an admitted former Islamophobe who originally began studying these very Hadith that we're talking about, in his own words, to attack Islam. And, and just like late David Wood gets paid to do. And in Dr. Little's d dissertation videos and articles and so forth, he mentions many of the exact same points that I've previously mentioned in the other debate and th those that I'll mention here today, thereby confirming my arguments in both the previous and current debate. And he says in his article, and I quote, I first encountered the hadith of Aisha's marital, uh, uh, Aisha's marital age as a teenage new atheist and Islamophobe. And he says, naturally, Islamophobes will assert that the Muslim acceptance of the authenticity of these hadith causes child marriage amongst Muslims. Therefore, he says, by criticizing Muslims for accepting this hadith, Islamophobes claim that they're somehow making the world a better place. But he says, this is false on two accounts. Firstly, most Islamophobes are simply lying or deluding themselves. When a Muslim does reject the hadith in question, Islamophobes will point out that the hadith is canonical, at least to Sunni Muslims, such that the Muslim must accept it. But he says if the goal of the Islamophobe is really to eradicate child marriage, then this makes no sense. Why are they taunting their Muslim interlocutor or indeed arguing in such a way to move their Muslim interlocutor towards accepting a hadith that validates child marriage? He says if, however, the true intention of the or impulse of the Islamophobe is simply to lash out at Muslims, like David Wood always does, then this makes perfect sense. He says, no matter what the position the Muslims take, Islamophobe, uh, Islamophobes will find some pretext to attack them. And he says, this is true of most bigots, and their cited rationales invariably turn out to be pretext, and their real motivation is simply a deep-seating resentment, hatred, and discomfort towards the given target group. And this sure sounds like he's describing David Wood to me. And these are also points that I mentioned in the previous debate, when I said by attacking the credibility of the Prophet, peace be upon him, Islamophobes are indirectly attacking all Muslims and Islam in general. So the honesty of Dr. Joshua Little is quite profound. But once again, he is a non-Muslim scholar of Hadith with no dog in the fight. And he's describing the thinking, tactics, and motivation of Islamophobes. He's describing the, the tactics of a person just like David Wood. So each and every description describes David Wood to a T, excluding, of course, the financial gain that he receives from his followers who keep showering him with money for his ongoing efforts to discredit Islam. So it's important to note that Dr. Joshua Little has, again, no dog in the fight, and he claims, and I quote, that every single one of the Age of Aisha quote-unquote consummation hadith were developed from a single unreliable source. So in addressing the findings of Dr. Little in an article by a Muslim brother, Dr. Javad Hashmi, with the study of religion at Harvard University, also known as the Impactful Scholar on YouTube, he said the following in his article, Oxford study sheds light on Muhammad's quote unquote underage wife, Aisha. New scholarship suggests the story of Islam's prophet marrying a minor is baseless propaganda fabricated for political and sectarian motives. And he says the following in his article, and I quote, after analyzing all the various versions of the Aisha marital report, Dr. Little concludes the hadith was fabricated whole cloth by a narrator named Hisham ibn Urwa after he relocated to Iraq. Little includes other port reports, such as Aisha reportedly playing with dolls in Muhammad's household in his overall critical assessment, deeming them to be partisan, sectarian, and political stories that are historically untrue. In other words, he says, 
Critical historians have little reason to believe Aisha was in fact married as a child. What makes Little's contribution especially noteworthy, he says, is that he argues the case from a rigorous academic perspective, even refining a scholarly methodology called the Isnad Kumatan analysis. And he says it should of course be noted that even within classical Islamic tradition, there has always been reason to doubt the Aisha marital hadith that are in question here today. As Little writes in his dissertation, Hisham ibn, ibn Arwa, the originator of the report, was considered unreliable, even according to traditional criteria. At least after he relocated to Iraq, he was accused of senality and a form of academic deception called tatalus, which is either it's out, outright lying or a sloppiness in transmission or both. And according to Little, the claim about Aisha's age was once again a part of a medieval sectarian propaganda concocted by a Sunni figure to bolster the image of Aisha against Shiite detractors. And this is why Dr. Jonathan Brown says in his work, How We Know Early Hadith Critics Did Matan Criticism, he says the following, and I quote, he says, I'm not suggesting that a Hadith critics like al-Bukhari and Ibn Hanbal were forerunners in the historical critical method, meaning that they weren't and he's been quoting them, they weren't analyzing these hadith in that way. He says, as generations of Western scholars have demonstrated, even the revered Sahian, the people that he's mentioned, he's mentioned a moment ago, are replete with anachronistic reports that grew out of a political, legal, and sectarian feuds of the first two centuries of Islam, end of quote. But maybe David Wood needs uh, the words of even an earlier Muslim scholar who already came to these same conclusions many years before. Muhammad Haikal in the, the book Life Muhammad, a book I've had over 30 years, I mentioned in the previous debate, published in 1930. He says, and I quote, after Muhammad's death, the Muslims differed and they fabricated thousands of hadith and reports to support their various causes. And upon the murder of Uthman, civil war broke out amongst the Muslims, and Aisha fought against Ali and Ali's supporters. And the fabrication of thousands of hadith spread to the point that Ali had to reject the practice and warn against it. But he said this didn't stop the hadith narrators from fabricating their stories, either in support of a cause they advocated or of a virtue or practice that they thought would have appeal if vested in prophetic tradition. He says hadith narrators deprecated the prophetic traditions reported by the party of Ali and those reported by the party of Aisha. And he says the, this is why the objective researcher, the objective researcher investigating these books must therefore have a standard by which he can evaluate these various claims, end of quote. So again, not the double standards of a person like David Wood, but fair objective standards. So in regards to these standards, back to the Institute of Islamic Jurisprudence uh, regarding addressing the standards of Hadith. Principle number seven. They're answering the question, what happens if two authentic hadiths contradict one another? And they say that just having a stronger chain of narration doesn't necessitate a hadith superiority. They said this is one of the many reasons why it's not recommended for people who do not possess the mastery of hadith, which David Wood does not have, to take up a position where they devise their own rulings on what they understand from the hadiths that they read. More than often, they say, they will find many contradictions in the hadith collections, and this will lead them to unnecessary confusion that David Wood has admitted to, strife and conflict with others that David Wood always tries to cause, and division amongst the Muslim body of believers that David Wood tries to instigate. So in his admitted confusion about the hadith, David Wood is certainly guilty of causing this strife and confusion and uh, the conflict with the others and attacking the Muslim body of believers. But know what, what author Carolyn Bowe says, and once again, a non-Muslim scholar with no dog in the fight, in her book, uh, her monograph rather, Minor Marriage and Early Islamic Law, she says, and I quote, that numerous debates still swirl about the authenticity of the narrative of Aisha's marital age, implying that these, ha these debates have gone on for centuries. Uh, she also mentions another strong point, which is, and I quote, the seeming absence of this hadith from early Islamic law where we might otherwise expect its usage in early Islamic jurisprudence. She also mentions that Imam Malik, uh, one, a very well respected scholar of hadith, uh, Imam Malik is one of the many jurists who do not re rely on the hadith by Hisham ibn Urwa and those of his students uh, and also mentions that Ibn Tamiya and Ibn Al-Qayyim also shy away from its usage. And regarding uh, hadiths of Aisha's marital, marriage to the Prophet, uh, peace be upon them both, uh, with the International Journal of Islamic Discourse, volume 21, uh, published June two, 2022, they say the following, and listen to what these uh, early ha uh, scholars had to say. They say clearly that the rejection of these hadith was also posed by Malik ibn Anas, Hisham ibn Urwa's former student, 
who became a prominent scholar with himself, who did not accept the Hadith by Hisham ibn Urwa, his own teacher, while he was in Iraq. Their next source on volume, uh, volume 11, page 50 says, I have been told that Imam Malik objected on those narratives of Hisham ibn Urwa um, w w uh, in the reports that were reported from the people in Iraq. The third uh, uh, source say, states that when he was old, Hisham ibn Urwa's uh, memory suffered quite badly. So in closing, I've demonstrated that no early mon enemy of Muhammad ever made that this claim, the claim that this marriage was anything but ethical. They never say it was unethical. And I've given an overview of the, on the opinions of multiple scholars who, who have questioned the reliability of all the Aisha marital hadith that were generated over time from a single unreliable source, and I'll expound upon that as we proceed. And I've also discussed the principle, principles of hadith standards, um, both before and after Ibn Kathir, by the way, uh, uh, with scholars who disagreed with him because of the conflict that existed between the age of Aisha quote-unquote consummation hadith and other historical events mentioned in more reliable hadith. And also according to the Institute of Islamic Jurisprudence, all scholars are giving their opinions and opinions aren't necessarily factual, which means that there's reason for doubt. So are the hadiths open to dispute, inter interpretation, and debate? Yes, here we are uh, still debating this topic. Is there reason for confusion? that David Wood has admitted, admitted to, yes. The hadith, are op uh, the evidence about the hadith is questionable and debatable, therefore there's, no, there's, de there re there's reason for doubt and confusion that David Wood has admitted to, therefore there should be no justifiable reason to accuse Muhammad, peace be upon him, of, of any wrongdoing or to suggest that this marriage was anything but ethical. And I will close with that. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much for that opening. We are going to kick it into the rebuttal section. We'll start with David. These are 12 minute rebuttals. David, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Kenny. Uh, Kenny has a picture of me in my wife's nightie. Pretty creepy that he carries that around, but <laughs> he left out the fact that I was making fun of Muhammad in that video because there are tons of hadiths where Muhammad used to dress up in his wife's garments, but maybe those hadiths are also horribly unreliable. As for the act, check, check. As for the actual topic, I'm seeing a tremendous irony in some of my recent debates. These debates are turning into David Wood, defender of orthodox Islamic sources, versus Muslims attacking and destroying their own most trusted Islamic sources. These are great times to live in, my friends. I have to say, though, Muslims, if we now live in a world where David Wood has become the defender of Islamic orthodoxy. You guys got problems. In my opening statement, I pointed out that according to the Quran, Muhammad's marriage to Aisha was perfectly acceptable because the Quran allows sex with prepubescent girls. So I don't know why Kenny is so sensitive about this issue and attacking the idea that Muhammad would have sex with a prepubescent girl when the Quran clearly allows it. I pointed out that According to Islam's most trusted sources, Muhammad married Aisha when she was six or seven years old, and that he consummated marriage when she was nine years old. I specifically quoted, what? Sahih al-Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, Sunan Abu Dawud, Sunan An-Nasai, and Sunan Ibn Majah. These are supposedly the best, most reliable sources on the life and teachings. There's a silence button, Kenny. Sorry about that. Um, these are supposedly the best sources on Muhammad's life and teachings. If they're wrong, this means that Islam's best, most reliable sources are pretty unreliable. Ibn Kathir, one of the most respected Muslim, com Muslim scholars in history, a man who knew the Muslim sources better than everyone here combined, said that no one disputes the fact that Aisha was none. Kenny thinks that this hadith originates with Hisham ibn Urwa. We'll, uh, we'll talk about that in a bit, but uh, keep in mind, Hisham is Aisha's grand nephew, who says he got this from his father, Urwa ibn al-Zubair, one of the most trusted hadith uh, collector, I mean, one of the most uh, trusted tradents in hadith, and he knew Aisha. So, if you wanna just say Hisham's making this up, he's a liar, I hope you're prepared to stand before Allah and explain why you're calling Hisham a liar. Um, as far as Islamic scholars on this, you do have differences of opinion uh, between scholars. So uh, let me give you an example. Uh, Muhammad Salah ibn Munajid, who runs the Islamic scholars website, Islam Q&A, 
Uh, lots of interesting stuff in there. Uh, he says in his article on this topic where it was being pointed out that, hey, there are some people who actually dispute the age of Aisha. He writes, the definition of the age of Aisha when the prophet did the marriage contract with her as being six years and of the age when he consummated the marriage with her as being nine years is not a matter of ijtihad, individual opinion, on the part of scholars such that we could argue whether it is right or wrong. Rather, this is a historical narration which is proven by evidence that confirms its soundness and the necessity of accepting it. And then he gives a ton of reasons. We can go into more of them. I'll just give a, uh, I'll just give a, couple, a couple of examples. He says, one, it was narrated by the individual concerned herself, namely Aisha, and is not something that someone else said about her or the description of a historian or a Hadith scholar. Rather, it comes in the context of her speaking about herself. Two, the report from Aisha is in the soundest of books after the Book of Allah, namely the two Sahihs of al-Bukhari and Muslim, which I quoted. Three, it was narrated from Aisha via a number of chains of narration, not by only one Isnad, only as some ignorant people claim. And he goes on and on and on. He, he also addresses the claim that uh, Hisham ibn Urwa was, uh, was, uh, uh, had a faulty memory and so on. He, he attacks that. He says this came from one guy and it's not even what he meant. And you can't trust that. You can't trust that. We have other, we, we, people generally trust Hisham ibn Urwa. But he goes on to point out there are reports from all kinds of people, even reports that don't include Hisham ibn Urwa says there are reports from people other than Aisha that speak of the prophet's marriage to her when she was nine years old. Um, five, this is what Aisha narrated uh, concerning herself and it was conveyed by the narrators, narrators from her and is what is stated in all the historical sources that give the biography of Aisha. There is no difference among them concerning that. Six, the historical sources are also agreed that Aisha, blah, 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 anyway, the, he gives a, 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 well, I don't know how much of I want to read this because I definitely want to get to Joshua Little. All right, let me go on to, uh, to some of Kenny's other points here. Um, Kenny cites Jonathan Brown. That's weird. Brown was asked about the hadiths on Muhammad's age Samara when she was nine and how these would stack up against criticism. He said, I think it's an authentic report. In fact, I think the scholar whose work does represent the state in the field of the field in Western scholarship on Hadith, the German scholar Harold Mosky, if you were to take his methods of dating Hadiths, I think you could date that report of Aisha back to actually about the time of Aisha. So he's saying you can date this to the time of Aisha using the methodology of critical scholars of Hadiths. So pretty strange to attribute it to someone later. Kenny appeals, Kenny appeals to Joshua Little to reject this hadith. He says, Joshua Little has no dog in this fight. That's nonsense, of course. Little repeatedly says that he's uh, combating Islamophobia and he's gonna take this argument away from Islamophobes and so on. And also he wrote his master's thesis arguing that uh, Aisha wasn't nine years old. And then later, of course, he rejected his own argument and then presented a new one. So it kind of looks like he's you know, taken multiple cracks at trying to respond to this. Um, but he did write his doctoral dissertation on the age of Aisha, and he does conclude that you can't trust these sources. Uh, what Kenny doesn't seem to tell anyone is that Joshua Little thinks the Hadith are garbage. Not, not these Hadith in particular, Hadith in general are garbage. Let me tell you what Joshua Little says, since uh, this is a pretty big part of Kenny's case. There's a quote from his dissertation that hadith are unreliable, that, given any, that, that a given matin cannot be taken at face value as an accurate datum from the first Islamic century, and that any given asnad cannot be taken at fast face value as an accurate record of a matin's provenance cannot be seriously contested for multiple reasons. And his first point is pre pretty much everyone, Christians, Jews, uh, Muslims, everyone was making stuff up by, back then. That's his first point. He says, secondly, there is the high frequency of contradictions within the Hadith corpus, which necessitates the occurrence of a huge amount of fabrication, interpolation, and or mutation, and therefore skepticism towards any given Hadith. Thirdly, there is the ubiquity of fabrication and interpolation, 
both reported and demonstrable in the Hadith corpus, which again casts doubt upon the rest of the corpus. Fourthly, there is the rapid extreme mutation and growth of reports that evidently took place over the course of a century or more of oral transmission, which means that any given matin, matin is like the content of the story, so what's the story being reported? Which means that any given matin, regardless of the isnad, is likely at best heavily distorted and at worst obliterated beyond its original form. Fifthly, Fifthly, there is the belated emergence of hadith as a genre and corpus, largely during the 8th and 9th centuries, which straightforwardly precludes the authenticity of most ascriptions to the 7th century. Joshua Little thinks these hadiths are garbage. To, to be clear, he does believe you can occasionally find relevant uh, points or, or material about Muhammad there. But it's basically like walking through a garbage dump to him. You can walk through a garbage dump and find some useful things. You can walk through a garbage dump and say, oh, look, here's a toothbrush, hardly been used. You can find things in a garbage dump. That's how he treats the hadiths. Now, he wouldn't say garbage dump, but you, I just read you what he said. It's like a garbage dump going to the hadiths. This is the man that Kenny is relying on to argue that... Aisha was not nine years old when Muhammad had sex with her. Uh, but I, I have to say, Kenny, yes, if we're treating these hadiths like garbage, if we're treating Sahih al-Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, Sunan Abu Dawud, like garbage that you can sift through and maybe using the methods of Western critical scholars come up with something by an argument, but that other than that, you just can't trust. You have to, you have to approach them with extreme skepticism if you're arguing that, Kenny, I will agree with you that if you use that methodology, you don't have to conclude that Muhammad married Aisha because you can't conclude much of anything about Muhammad. You don't have anything to go on. If your most reliable sources are garbage, congratulations. We don't know how old Aisha was because we don't know much of anything about Muhammad. It was, written, it was a bunch of material written by liars and passed around by morons. That's not my position. We are once again in the very strange position where I have more respect for Muslim historians than Muslims do. This is an, these are great times to live in, I have to say. So there are really only two possibilities here before us. Either Islam's most trusted sources, keep in mind there are all kinds of sources, and they are kind of ranked according to their level of authority. Um, Kenny keeps insisting, ah, oh, maybe these ideas. Hey, Kenny, the, these, these collections, they come up with, they, have, they even have little grades at the bottom of them. Over and over and over again, when you read the hadiths about Aisha, Sahih, 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 Sahih. So you're talking about multiple Sahih narrations spread around the various collections. And it's Joshua Little who said there's, there, there's, there are over 200. He counts over 200 of these. He thinks they're all wrong. I'm fine with that. If you want to say we don't know anything about Muhammad, the sources are garbage, we don't know anything about him, great. You can do that. You can, you can, you can tell us. If, if, hey, Kenny, if, you're, if you want to go down that road, I'll go down that road with you. But you got to pay the toll. And the toll is, you don't know anything about your prophet, so stop dressing like him, walking like him, talking like him, because you don't know anything about him. Thanks, David, for that rebuttal. We'll go to Kenny for a 12-minute rebuttal as well. Kenny, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. I would like to thank David Wood for proving my argument. This, the, these things that he's quoting from about these hadith in question that Dr. Dr. Little's talking about, we're talking about these specific hadith that we're talking about today. Not all hadith. He's talking specifically, you can look it up for yourself, or for all the little gigglers out here in the, in the front row. Uh, you can go and look this article up yourself, Why I Studied the Aisha Marital Hadith by Dr. Joshua Little. And he's talking about only the hadith from Hisham ibn Urwa and those of his students. He's not talking about all of the hadith, like David Wood is saying. And you mentioned, as I mentioned, that Dr. Little says in his article that the Islamophobes are usually lying or deluding themselves, right? lying or deluding themselves. David Wood is being 
uh, deceptive in that he's not telling you that the hadith in question are not all hadith. Again, Dr. Joshua Little is addressing specific hadith. They are related to Aisha's marital age and all of those from Hisham ibn Urwa, not just those from Hisham ibn Urwa, but all of those from his students that all came from Iraq, where in the Al-Shafi school of thought, where child marriage is accepted. Only those hadith is he calling garbage, and so am I. So let's, let's walk hand in hand if you want to, although I won't shake your hand because I told you earlier that I would not, and I told you why. Because again, this is comedy hour for a person like David Wood, who uses mockery and shock value and trying to make it seem that he knows something that he doesn't. Actually, he knows more than, he, than, than he's, he's given, uh, 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 than, than, than he's relaying to his followers. He's only giving you a half, half of the story, just like he did here today, prime example prime example. So let's say, let's say for the sake of argument, let's say for the sake of argument, and despite all the evidence to the contrary, that Aisha was in fact nine years old at the time of quote unquote consummation. What does this word mean? And allow me to recall the two hadith that David Wood mentioned in his, his recent uh, 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 video where he said he was so confused, hadith 4915 and 4933 in Abu Dawud, which says the following, and I quote, some women came to me and while I was swinging, they took me and made me prepared and decorated me. And I was then brought to the messenger of Allah and he took up cohabitation with me when I was nine. Now note, none of these hadith in question, not a single one says the, the, the prophet had sex with me when I was nine. None of them say that. So why would translators use the word consummation in some hadith and use the word cohabitation in others? Is it because it's some big cover up because the Muslims are somehow ashamed and looking for excuses? Or could it be that these hadith uh, or these uh, words are synonymous with one another and that a marriage in Islam is actually ethical and considered quote unquote consummated upon cohabitation either with or without sex. So before I address those points, allow me to address the double standards of David Wood. Again, according to the Bible, Isaac married the possibly three to 10 year old Rebecca uh, and the, that, that evidence is debatable. And, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, peace be upon them both, is depicted as marrying the, 11, uh, the 90 to 80 to nine year old uh, uh, Joseph, when she was 11 or 12 years old, the evidence is there is debatable. So were those marriages ethical and consummated? And did those couples cohabit with one another? Is it possible they ever see, ever seen one another naked? Well, sure there is. With or without sex? They, I don't believe they had sex. So why doesn't David Wood uh, accuse them of pedophilia and attack them? It's because he has double standards. But personally, I have no problem with those marriages, and I'll tell you why. Because in my research, according to Christian canon law, which is strikingly similar to the laws of marital laws of Judaism and Islam, as I'll demonstrate, the marriages were, these, those marriages were both, uh, in, were both ethical and consummated, even without sex. So, according to, uh, so as far as consummation and cohabitation, these words are synonymous according to thesaurus.plus. It says cohabitation and consummation are semantically the same. So consummation, defined by dictionary.com, is to bring to a state of perfection, to fulfill, build, establish. No mention of sex being required for that. To complete an arrangement or agreement or the like by the pledge of a signing of a contract. They use the example the company consummated its deal to, to buy a smaller firm. No sex was required for that deal to go through. Uh, Merriam-Webster goes on to say that consummation is described as the consummation of a contract by mutual signature. You can consummate a deal by mutual signature, no sex required. Uh, they say specifically the consummation of marriage through mutual agreement. Again, a, a couple can get married. They don't necessarily have to sex, have sex. Of course, they're probably going to eventually, but uh, the ultimate end to, to finish, to establish. No mention of sex for that being required. Cohabitation is defined by Mary Webster, Webster as to live together as a married couple. Married couples can live together with or without sex. They, they cohabit in a small apartment is the example they use. And look at the example of the Prophet Muhammad cohabiting with Aisha in a small room. Peace and blessed be upon them both. To live together in one another's company. People can live together in one another's company with or without sex. To exist together. People can do that with or without sex. So both consummation and cohabitation are used to establish relationships with or without sex. So uh, what's the Arabic word that's used? The Arabic word in the hadith is bana biha. Sometimes you see wabana or thabana biha, wabana biha. You may see um, um, other, other, other slight derivatives, but most of the time you'll see the word bana biha for the word consummation or cohabitation. Matter of fact, they use it for both words, all right? Bana biha, which means to build 
establish, cohabit. That's the definition in the Arabic. Well, lo and behold, in the, in the biblical Hebrew, the word bani, the etymology of the word bani in the biblical Hebrew from the verb bana, once again, according to Abram Publications, says the definition is to build, establish, begin, or forge. No mention of sex being required to do those things. And according to Fatwa 127305, regarding the word bana biha used in the hadith in question here today, it says al-mubarak, a very well respected uh, a scholar of hadith said according to the master uh, masterpiece of al-awani another great scholar of hadith said the words in the hadith banabiha translated as consummated and or co cohabitation in the hadith means to build or establish a home for the woman to enter into you can do that with or without sex even abu zaid al kuwani he differed slightly saying the meaning of what means to establish a relationship or a union in the name of Allah. No need of, no mention of sex being required. Uh, al Badawi from the Shafi school stated that the terms means to be shrouded together as, a, as if under a tunic or a covering or a hijab or a, as a garment, a husband and wife being a garment for one another in a close quarter where sexual intercourse could take place. Doesn't mean it's a, a requirement for the marriage to be ethically established. So it's reported by al Shahab that even Malik and even uh, uh, in Abu Hanifa said that the words uh, that Banabiha means in the Hadith that a husband and wife have entered into an Islamically acceptable agreement, and that means touching and kissing are now acceptable. That doesn't mean that they can't still establish. Uh, uh, obviously, they can cohabit with one another in a quote unquote consummated and ethical marriage even before sex happened. And I remind you that the Prophet himself, peace be upon him. Um, no, well, let, let me go to the, the Code of Canon Law to dis discuss uh, double standards of David Wood for a moment. In the Code of Canon Law, by example, it says the consent of the parties in 1057.1, Code of Canon Law, Title, title 7, uh, 10, 1057.1, by, by example, says, the, in Christian canon law, says the consent of parties legitimately manifested between persons qualified law makes marriage. doesn't say that sex is a requirement. Not that they won't eventually have sex, but the, the marriage is established upon the consummation and cohabitation of the couple. 1057.2 says matrimonial consent is the act of will by which a man and woman accept one another in a covenant in order to establish marriage. They can do that before the sex takes place. 1061.1 says, listen closely, a valid marriage in Christianity between baptized people is called ratum tantum, even if no sexual intercourse is taking place. So are those marriages ethical and valid upon consummation? Uh, being consummated upon upon cohabitation? Yes, they are. Mary and Joseph did it. Didn't they, they cohabit with one another and travel around without having sexual relations? Was their marriage unethical? Was it consummated? Was it a legitimate marriage? Well, yes, it was. So is it fair to presume at all that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, if in fact Aisha was nine years old, even though the evidence is highly deba debatable, would presume, uh, is it fair to presume that the Prophet could have established a relationship with with Aisha and cohabited with her and waited until she was physically and mentally and emotionally prepared to have sex before he did so? Is it at all possible? Yes, it is. Therefore, there's reason for doubt and, and you shouldn't accuse uh, someone uh, 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 in regards to this. So, so consummation of marriage without, without intercourse in Islam. Consummation of marriage without, in Islam, uh, without intercourse in Islam, you can find this information on the Mathabal website. The article says there, a marriage in Islam is still valid if sexual intercourse is not taking place, as per the comfort and mutual agreement of the couple. In Islam, they say, quote unquote, consummation of marriage occurs when the couple spend time together after the marriage in seclusion and or privacy. They state clearly in this article that you can find yourself, intercourse is not necessary for consummation of marriage from an Islamic point of view. This is the agreed upon position of the majority of jurors, including the Hanafi, the Jafari, the Maliki, the Hanbali schools of thought, and this was also the four opinions of the four caliphs after the Prophet Muhammad. Those are the most reliable sources in Islam. The four schools of thought and the four caliphs after the Prophet Muhammad who all agreed that a marriage is ethical and valid in Islam when you cohabit with your wife with or without sex. The Prophet, peace be upon him, had set him himself did this, and the Al Shafi school is the only school of thought that said that you have to have uh, sexual intercourse for this to, to be a uh, legitimate marriage. But again, that's from the Al Shafi school of thought from Iraq, where these hadith in question here today originated. So that was on their, their, their school of thought, and most, most Muslims do not accept that. So, according to uh, 
the Prophet himself in authentic hadith is found in our Adar al Qutni. You can read about it. The Prophet, peace be upon him, was recording and is saying, The husband who lifts the veil of his wife following the, the marriage ceremony, the nikah, and looks at her privately, the mahar, the bridal gift, becomes mandatory, whether he had sex with her or not. So therefore, they're living together, cohabiting ethically with and without sex. With and without sex. And it's recorded in Tafsir al Hawi that Imam uh, Ibn Omar, may Allah be pleased with him, said that when the doors are closed and the curtains are drawn and nudity is seen, the bride is entitled her mahar, the bridal gift and inheritance, and must complete the waiting period before sex can take place. So therefore, they are living together uh, in an ethical marriage, consummated, cohabiting with and without, with before and after sex. Okay, so in the sealed nectar, we have the example where the prophet himself did this. He had two wives that did not consummate marriage through uh, sexual relations. Uh, in the sealed nectar biography of the prophet, page 485, it says the two wives that Muhammad, peace be upon him, never uh, had sexual intercourse with, uh, one from the tribe of Bani Kalab and the other one from the royal Arabian tribe of the Banu al-Mustalik. So to summarize, the Prophet, peace be upon him, 30 co seconds. Cohabited with, he cohabited with two of his wives and consummated marriages without having sex with them. Was it, was it ethical? Consummated ethical marriages, cohabiting with them, did not yeah. have sex with them, the marriage was still valid. M Jai. Muslim men can marry divorced Muslim women and cohabit with them in a consummated God marriage. Knows with the requirement of waiting three, to move three months. Yes, sir. And so I'll close we'll jump, with that. <clears throat> we'll jump into the six-minute rebuttals, and then after that, we'll have 25 minutes of open dialogue. With that, David, the floor is yours for six minutes. Uh, Ken Kenny says Joshua Little uh, wasn't talking about hadith in general. He was only referring to these specific hadiths about the age of Aisha. Now, Kenny, there are only two possibilities in this world. Either you haven't read his dissertation at all, or you're lying. Those are the two possibilities. No, I, I've never seen anyone who, who, who has more contempt uh, for the hadiths in general. And by the way, I already, I, I just quoted him for you. That hadith, not a specific hadith, this is on his introduction to his methodology. So it's before he goes through the hadiths about, uh, about Muhammad and Aisha. His, me, his chap, as a matter of fact, this is chapter one. Chapter one, methods and debates that hadith are unreliable, that any given matin cannot be taken at face value as an accurate datum from first century uh, of Islam, and that any given is not, cannot be taken at face value as an accurate record of a matin's provenance, cannot be seriously contested for multiple reasons. Then he goes through all those, all those reasons about how there are all these general problems for these sources. If you, if you, keep, if you continue reading, uh, or if you listen to his lectures, he's pretty clear. He believes that in early Islam, things were regional. Like there, there's the area of Kufa, and there's the area of uh, Syria, and there's the area of Mecca, and there's the area of Medina. And these guys, they had some commonalities, like on how many daily prayers there were and so on. Other than that, they're contradicting each other left and right. And it's later on, it's later on when you eventually get to this pan-Islamic consolidation where they come up with a methodology and then they're picking and choosing. Ah, oh, we'll take this from Mecca, we'll take this from Kufa and so on. Because the Islam back then just completely contradict, I mean, everyone was contradicting everyone else. And so when they had to sort of consolidate and come up with what is real Islam, they came up with this methodology, this Hadith criticism and so on. And then Joshua Little's view is that these people are all arguing amongst themselves. And if, you're into a, if you and I are in an argument, I just go back, I write a hadith that supports me, and I attach a list of names on it because that was the new official Islamic method. Joshua Little believed that these people were cooking up hadiths like they cook up falafel. And the population just gobbling it up like it's Ramadan. So that's, that's, that's Joshua Little's view. Again, if you read it, he, he, he treats the Hadith like a garbage dump. Of course you can't trust the Hadith about Muhammad and Aisha because you can't trust the Hadith in general. So again, Kenny, either you're not familiar with what he actually said or you're just flat out lying because there's no way you can read that, that dissertation and think that he has any respect at all for the Hadith. Again, just to be clear, he does believe you can get some details about Muhammad's life from them, but that's by applying Western academic standards and using some very interesting methodologies to attempt to get anything of value from them. 
Then we have consummation now doesn't mean had sex with. Kenny, Kenny, Kenny quoted Merriam-Webster's dictionary. Uh, here's Merriam-Webster's dictionary. Consummate, to make marital union complete by sexual intercourse. Guess what? That means the same thing in Islam. Do you know why? Because we're not as familiar with it. We're not as familiar with this anymore. But back then, marriage was a process, right? You had the proposal, then the, then the betrothal period, and then there was the consummation. That's when the two become one flesh, where they actually have sex. That, it's consummation because that's the final step, right? And Kenny, no, 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 no. That just means that um, even though they were, they, they were already married, so notice, they're already married at six or seven. And then there's this consummation. Ah, that's when they can start kissing. Seriously? That's how desperate we are. That's how desperate we are now uh, on this issue. Consummate no longer means consummate. Now consummate means move in with, maybe do a little kissing. Well, what's the, what's the, what's the other stage? What's the, what's the future stage? So very, very strange. Um, now, once again, all these sources which talk about consummating marriage uh, don't refer, don't have anything to do with having sex. Once again, I have to wonder, what, why would this be a problem? So now is Surah 65.4 also not talking about having sex with a prepubescent girl when the entire reason for the hadith, for the hadith was to establish a waiting period after a divorce, after a man has had sex with, with a girl, before another guy can come along and marry her and have sex with her. Maybe none of this is having sex. Maybe there just is no sex. I mean, we're just, oh my goodness, I don't know what to do. Um, so consummation doesn't mean had sex with. And then he, he, he gives examples and is asking why uh, we don't call these other people uh, pedophiles. I, Isaac married Rebecca. Have you noticed? Have you noticed how, how much they toss this around? Rebecca is called a young woman over and over and over again. And if she was three years old when she was uh, hauling hundreds of gallons of water for those camels, she's basically a superhero. That's, that's how desperate they are. Uh, and then he brings up, of course, the, the age of Mary. Uh, Mary is called a woman in the Bible, in the same Bible that calls 12-year-olds little girls. She's called a woman. We have no authoritative source on the age of Mary. Do you see that? Look, when, when, when we're talking about Muhammad's relationship with Aisha, there are dozens and dozens of sources that I have right now that I can quote you. If you factor in the Arabic, you're dealing with hundreds of sources of their most authoritative sources. And you're comparing this where no age at all is listed. It, they're just called left. young women or, or women. And you, they will look at that and say, see, why aren't you calling them a pedophile? I'll say it here, folks. If Isaac had sex with a three-year-old, I would in a heartbeat call him a pedophile. In a heartbeat. In a heartbeat. So, problem is, for Kenny, there's no evidence. We've got a ton of evidence on Muhammad. And time, we'll kick it over to Kenny for his six-minute rebuttal as well. Kenny, the floor is all yours. I would like to thank David Wood for once again proving my argument for me. David Wood has mentioned Dr. Joshua Little again. And I remind you that Dr. Joshua's little dissertation was specifically on the Aisha marital hadith. So the hadith, when he's talking about those hadith in that article and in his work, in his, in his dissertation, he's talking specifically about those marital hadith that are, that are questionable and, yes, garbage, right? And so I have no problem saying that uh, because, in fact, that they are garbage. So, so, again, David Wood is being deceptive. He's being dishonest with you. You can read the, the information yourself. Go find the article. Read it yourself. He's talking specifically. That's why it's called, his one article is titled, Why I Studied the Aisha Hadith. His dissertation is on the Aisha Hadith, not all Hadith in general. It is known. It's a known fact. The, the Muslims themselves know that there was Sahih Bukhari, by example, had to go through 600,000 different hadiths, most of which they tossed out and threw away because they were garbage. Because as you will see, that there was political strife amongst the Muslims. They were riding against one another. It was a political game. So they're trying to bolster the, the image of Aisha against Shiites, and the Shiites are trying to counter that with their own hadith, back and forth, back and forth, just like David Wood has admitted to. He's proven my case for me about the reasonable doubt, a, an innocent, I mean, a, a decent person with intellectual honesty 
You do not accuse someone of wrongdoing when the evidence against them is debatable. If me and in, in, uh, any other Muslim is sitting up here and he takes one side of the argument and I take another side of the argument, it's because of an ongoing, for centuries long, debate amongst the Muslims themselves. I mentioned that uh, Hanbali and, uh, and all the, 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 the four schools of thought, the primary four schools of thought in Islam, they all reject the Hadith by Hisham ibn Urwa. The four caliphs rejected the hadith by Hisham ibn Urwa. They state that you know, uh, the, these hadith weren't reliable. And so thank you, David Wood, for proving my case. In regards to Surah 65.4, Surah Al-Talaq, regarding divorce, who gets, who gets divorced in this world? Do children get divorced? Men and women get divorced. These, so in, in the hadith, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in this verse, rather, in the surah, it says, Uriblay min shaitan rajim. It says, if you're in doubt, the, waiting, the period of waiting will be three months for those women who have ceased menstruating and those women, and for those who have not menstruated, the waiting period of, of those who are pregnant will be until they deliver their burden and Allah makes things easy for those who are mindful of him. But what does it say in the Arabic? The words in the Arabic, it says for those who are in, for, for those who, right? So it's referring to, if you are in doubt, the waiting period will be three months for menisa'ikam. Menisa'ikam. What does that mean? It means women. And when it says, for those women, for, for those women, the Arabic word there is wala'i, for those women. These, the Arabic has, says nothing about children, says nothing about little girls. It says wala'i, for those women in particular, it's talking about the whole surah. Surah Al-Talaq, right, is about divorced women in particular. How do you engage in, and so forth with, with divorced women? So the verse is addressing women uh, that one, one intends to divorce, who's already been divorced, who has had sexual relations already in a previous marriage. It's also giving guidance to help ensure that uh, uh, there's no confusion about who the father is for the child and so forth. Um, in the event that the, the, that the divorced woman is pregnant, it's also addressing mature women who are past the age of menopause and mature women who have not yet menstruated for whatever reason. So when it says wali'i, for those women who have not yet menstruated for, for whatever reason, it's not talking about little girls. If it meant little girls, it would say specifically little girl, little child, little, little baby in a diaper. It's not saying that. It's saying wali'i, for those what? Those women. Again. The word, the initial word used is nisa ikam, for the women. Nisa ikam. The word nisa is women. It has nothing to do with children. Nothing to do with little girls. Okay, so, uh, so yes, yeah, so um, again, in, in regards to the Arabic terminology, consult Quran.com. According to a narrative reported by Ahmad ibn Hanbal, after the death of Prophet, Prophet Muhammad's wife Khadija, um, um, well, I'm not going to get in that because it's too, too long of a, a point to, to address. But nevertheless, nevertheless, so what, what's transpired here is that David Wood has again proven my argument in both the first debate and this debate by, by, by himself admitting that there is, there is disagreement amongst the Muslims. There's disagreement amongst the Muslims themselves. I said this from the very beginning. And I've used non-Muslim sources along the way because they have no dog in the fight. They're just giving their honest opinion based on what they found or what they've studied in depth. Dr. Joshua Little has done in-depth scholarly research on the Isnad Kamatan analysis. In-depth. And he is a non-Muslim with no dog in the fight, has no reason to lie, and he's specifically addressing in his dissertation, in his dissertation, to get his doctorate, he wrote specifically about the hadith regarding this marriage to Aisha in particular. All the hadith could come from the original primary source, Hisham ibn Urwa, after he relocated to Iraq, and those of his students who also embellished upon those hadith and then fabricated their own hadith in support of what was stated. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Kenny. We will jump into the open dialogue. This will be 25 minutes. Then we'll have four-minute closings and Q&A afterward. Gentlemen, the floor is all yours. Yeah, uh, Kenny, oh, sorry. <clears throat> Kenny, uh, I I'm still really confused by your appeal to uh, Joshua Little. I'll just read a little section here. Um, I already read a large section where he goes through uh, multiple reasons why he doesn't 
trust Hadith. He's talking about Hadith in general. And then he says, these general conclusions are primarily, primarily the result of, and he gives a bunch of uh, other Western academic Hadith scholars. And he says, for all of these reasons, and indeed for any one of them, skepticism obtains. Any given matin was likely created long after the relevant, relevant events and or distorted in the course of transmission. And any given isnad was likely created long after anyone could remember the actual transmission history of the matin in question. There was a quite a range of specific mechanisms or processes involved in the creation and alteration of hadith which are often attested in traditional Islamic scholarship. The matins of Hadith were variously, and he gives a long list, crafted by oral storytellers and preachers who valued, notice it's preachers, not talking about one guy, Hisham. Oral storytellers and preachers who valued education, education, entertainment above all else from a common stock of material. So inferred. it should not be a surprise. Right, I know this article, David. So, uh, I, I can't tell so, you to. So, hang on, no, hang on. No, I, just I, want, I, I just want to get the final. Go uh, ahead, but you're, you're taking up a lot of time. I'll skip to the end. I'll skip to the end. Yeah, I'll yeah. skip to the end. He says the relative weight of these various processes or mechanisms is still up for debate, but mm. the general falsity of the general falsity of hadith entails that some combination thereof or something like them must have been a play in the must have been at play in the formation of the extant corpus during the 8th and 9th centuries he says regardless skepticism obtains regarding hadith as it stands okay any given hadith sahih or otherwise should be presumed to be inauthentic or unreliable until the contrary can be demonstrated. Allah Akbar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for proving my case. You proved You're my welcome. case. You're welcome. I'll agree you, with you. you. Have, I'll go hold down on this now. Road. Hold I'll on now. You, you, you went on for quite a while I'll there. Go. You have proved my case with the very article that I mentioned, Allah Akbar. Because those, what he's talking about, again, his dissertation and this article that he's reading is that article titled, Why I, I Study the Aisha Marital Hadith? Is that what you're reading there, David? This is his 500-page Oxford doctoral dissertation. Oh, and and I've, got that right, I've got that right here. Okay, yeah, so and, exactly. And so along, along with that, he He's mentioned, not even talking about those hadiths yet. This he, is on his no, general using, methodology on, chapter. Right. This is so, a general methodology chapter. So based on my argument, based on my argument, we're, we're arguing whether or not uh, this marriage was ethical. And my argument was at the very beginning, do you accuse someone of wrongdoing when the evidence against them is debatable? And when people are arguing and debating with one another and they're writing against one another, it's, it's, the scholars know about this, David. This is not like some big surprise. You're saying this as though that, you know, the Muslims themselves don't know that there was 600,000 hadith that, uh, that uh, Sahih Abu Qari had to go through and 500,000 that Sahih Muslim had to go through. And they only chose a, a, a small number to add to their collections, right? And so... That means that the hadith were in question. That doesn't mean that all the hadith are in question. Dr. Joshua Little is specifically, find the articles yourselves. Find, the artic find his dissertation yourself. And you'll see that it, it, even, if, even if he was talking about all hadith, which he was not, He's talking about specific hadith. When he's using saying in general, and he's mentioned Sahih Muslim, and he's saying and, and Sahih Bukhari, he's talking in reference to the Aisha marital hadith that are in question today. That's what he wrote, wrote his doctorate on. So and it, let me summarize with this, David. That, so you have proven my case. You've literally fallen on your face and proven my case, Allahu Akbar, just like I knew that it would happen. I knew it would happen that way. Right, I knew Katie, it would happen. Uh, yeah, way. let me go ahead and respond to that. Uh, You've proven uh, my uh, case. Again, th there is no way, no way you read this dissertation unless you're, you know you're lying about this because there, the, you, you, you cannot go a page in this dissertation without, without seeing, uh, especially in the, in the methodology section, that he thinks these things were made up long after. In fact, the methodology, the methodology in his discussion of methodology that, that Western academic Hadith scholars use is, is virtually right. the opposite now in many on. ways. Now hold Hang on, on one second, now one second. We'll... I just want to explain the methodology okay. then. The methodology that, that Western academic Hadith scholars use is the opposite in the relevant ways of the Muslim methodology. In other words, when a Muslim Hadith scholar 
looks at an asnad, he says, oh, look at this perfect asnad. This shows that this, is, this, this, is, this, is, this works in favor of hadith. When a Western academic hadith scholar looks at that same asnad, if he sees a perfect asnad, he said, this is clearly, this is clearly made up. This is clearly made up because the methodology didn't exist in the first century of Islam. So they made it up later. A Muslim Hadith scholar looks at a broken okay. Islam. No, no right. I'm just telling you what he said. Well, just, the broken well, Islam. Islam. No, just let me get to this part. Very a Western, a Muslim Hadith scholar looks at a broken Islam and says, oh, we can't trust that. A Western academic Hadith scholar okay. looks at All a right. broken Islam and says, well, that that's a good sign that it came before the development of the methodology. So that's actually probably oh, earlier. Okay, so they come to the opposite conclusions. All right, let, let me go ahead. Let me chime in here, David, before you try to take over the, the whole session here. Okay, so now note this. Uh, Malik ibn Anas, one of Hisham ibn Urwa's own students, rejected the hadith from Hisham ibn Urwa and those of all of his students. Malik ibn Anas, an early scholar of, of hadith, who lived and walked with Hisham ibn Urwa, who knew him personally, was his student, rejected the hadith in question that we're talking about today. Do hold you on, mean, hold do on, you, wait, hold do you, on. Do you mean didn't quote it or said it's false? Hold you on. didn't quote it or you said it's false? No, hold on, totally, I, I do I want to just, I, I do, I'll give you a chance, David. I do want to just hear more yeah. from Kenny. So, so Malik ibn Anas, the student of Hisham ibn Urwa, one of his students, Right, rejected those hadith that we're talking about and those of all the other students that saying that they're unreliable. Many others have stated that they're unreliable. David Wood has proven my case. Now, in regards to Dr. Joshua Little saying, uh, criticizing the hadith, remember, I'm the one that said that there were 600,000 hadith that Imam Bukhari went through. He only chose, I think, 6,000, uh, if I remember correctly. Uh, Imam uh, Sahih Muslim chose even less than that. But hold on, hold on, don't chime in yet. You, you went on for about seven or eight minutes. Now, now, Dr. Joshua Little mentions that in, in his dissertation, in his articles, in his general consensus about the hadith, meaning that, yes, there was multiple hadith, multiple hadith within those 600,000 to 500,000 collections that they had to look through that weren't, they were, they, were, they were garbage, they were unreliable. They tossed them out, they're, they're unreliable. Then there's others that was given, now, now, now note this, for one, hadith didn't become, start being, being uh, uh, labeled, for one, being graded until the ninth century. This is long after these hadith originally began uh, uh, being collected. They began being collected in the eighth century. They were given grades in the ninth century. And in that grading period, they, named, they, they, uh, they had some that were reliable, being um, uh, Sahih. They had some that were Hassan, which are questionable, which means some, some of the hadith in question, and I'll summarize, it won't take much more time, but the, some of the hadith in question, by example, in the Isnad, in the chain of narration, they had uh, some of the hadith by Hisham ibn Urwa and some of his students that had a, a broken link in the chain, meaning that some of the hadith didn't have the name, a name mentioned, and in the other hadith that had an, a particular name mentioned, that person mentioned in that chain was unreliable. That makes that, sahih, that, that hadith unreliable within itself. That's why they tossed out many of those hadith. And so the hadith in question, again, Dr. Joshua Little was writing specifically, and did he give a consensus about all hadith as I have done myself here today? You haven't scored any points with that. I'm the one that brought up 600,000 hadith, and most of which was, was, was tossed out. You didn't score any points with that, David Wood. All right, let, so, let me go and respond to it. Because Kenny, I mean, you know, I, I've said I'm willing to go down this road with you. I'm willing to agree. Well, put your I'm, boots on, cowboy. I'm, I'm, will, I'm, willing, I'm willing to agree. So if you're going to say, well, let, 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 let's go through what you just said again. So for anyone who's new to this, Bukhari, depending on your source, has, is said to have gone through 300 to 600,000 hadiths to get to the most, the absolute most reliable, which are recorded in Sahih al-Bukhari. These are considered the best of the best. Over and over and over again in Sahih al-Bukhari, we read about Aisha being six when Muhammad married her and nine when the marriage was consummated. Then you have all the details about uh, her dolls and so on, um, playing on a swing. You have all those stories, right? So notice, Bukhari went through literally hundreds of thousands that he thought were, were not good enough to be included. And then he gets to the best of the best. And now we're finding out from Kenny that the, even this, 
And keep in mind, this is considered the greatest. He's considered the best of the best. Right. So the best of the best. And we aren't talking best, about all hadith the in his collection. The best of the best. We're not no, no, no. This is what you, you see what he's doing? You see what he's doing? We're not talking about all the hadith in Sahih Bukhari's no, no, collection. No, no, no. I didn't say that. We're not talking about Kenny, that. Kenny. But, but, but let, me say, let me say something just real quick. Let me say something okay, real quick. Okay, then I want to get I remind you. Uh, I remind you. Uh, my battery's running low there. But I, rem I remind you, I wanted to read the quote that I mentioned earlier uh, in regards to, and I'll just summarize, in regards from the Islam uh, Institute of Islamic Jurisprudence that says that, um, that uh, when a weakness, of, a weakness in the chain of narration could have appeared as it progresses past a particular imam, right? And so even those that, are, that were perceived as being sahi or reliable in a particular at a particular period of time could have been deemed as unreliable later on as more more in-depth scholarly research of those particular hadith come into play and that's what's happened with the uh, with the uh, scholarly methodology of of dr joshua little and others who have determined that through the uh, it's not Kumatan analysis that when you start analyzing these hadith and putting things together that Things things start don't start adding they're they're not adding up regarding these particular hadith in question the Aisha marital hadith, right? So therefore, based on the Institute of Islamic Jurisprudence, you can reject those hadith. You reject those hadith even if an earlier imam accepted it. Some of them did. We 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 know that we realize that. But as more progressive scholarship comes about, with the advent of modern technology, as I mentioned earlier, then you can. Look at all the evidence and say, okay, now that we've, in, we've studied this even in, in more in depth, we can reject that. Now let me remind you, the Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim and the collectors of the Hadith were just that. They were the collectors of the Hadith. They didn't have time while going around and looking through 600,000 Hadiths and trying to analyze these, uh, you know, all that. They didn't have time to break down and, and go into great detail about, about the chains of narration. And so the modern scholarship has given us the, the ability to do that, just like modern scholarship with any other field that you would, you would look into. Sometimes the modern, a modern look at, at something from the past gives a more clear understanding of what's going on with it. And the fact of the matter is that the hadith in question, we should not accuse the prophet, peace be upon him, uh, unjustly based on what he's agreeing that the hadith are in question are unreliable. Thank you, David Wood. You proved my case. All right. Yeah. Um, so you basically got two methodologies here. You've got what's what's considered orthodox Islamic methodology as far as hadith criticism. If you if you use that methodology, Kenny's pointing out. Yes, you you. There are various reasons for dismissing specific hadiths. The hadith about Aisha. That's everywhere. You can't just say, oh, I found a weakness in one. Great, there are dozens and dozens They and all dozens. come from there the same source. Hold on, Let, let's clarify something. The hadith that we're talking about, all the marital hadith, as you'll see in Dr. Uh, Dr. Little's work and the works of other scholars as well, not just, not just a non-Muslim scholar. Others have said this is the same thing, that all of these hadith come from the people of Iraq. After, after Hisham ibn Urwa moved to Iraq, that's when he started bolstering the image of Aisha against Shiite detractors over there, the party of Ali. He was writing to uplift the status and, and image of Aisha amongst that party, and so did his students. He started conveying this information, and his students embellished upon it, took some of those hadith, embellished on it, twisted some words, and invented their own hadith. So they all come from the original primary source, being Hisham ibn Urwa, and all of those hadith coming from that region of Iraq Unreliable. Toss them out. All right. So uh, uh, notice, Kenny's, Kenny's claiming that all of this comes from one guy in Iraq. So this is... Uh, again, I didn't say this, that. This, this I is, said Hisham ibn Urwa and all of his students. Yeah, so yeah, you, so you, you twist, all, it, like you it, always do, you're twisting it, and turning it the It comes from him. If it's him and his students... He's his the students, original primary source. Yeah, so it all comes from him. Thank he, you. That's all right, That's all. Right. right. That's all but I didn't say he's the only one. that We're only, we're only talking about Hadith from okay. Hisham ibn Urwa. I never said that. Never made that claim. We're talking about Hisham ibn Urwa and the Hadith of all of his students. Uh, yes, you're saying it all came from him. Okay, so yeah. it was narrated. So this is a uh, this is again from Islam QA, this is a Muslim scholar site. It was narrated from Aisha via a number of isnads, not right. by only all, one isnad. All as some, schools. As, let me finish. All let me finish the, the quote. Why do you, it, why do you have a quote? Why well, do you go ahead. Me to quote but a it's all scholar? from the same source I just mentioned. By one, not by one isnad only, as some ignorant people claim. I know you're not saying there's one isnad, but you're that. saying. Let me finish. Okay. The most he says the most well known chain of narration is that of Hisham ibn Urwa ibn al-Zubair 
from his father, Urwa ibn al-Zubair, from Aisha. This is one of the soundest narrations as Urwa ibn al-Zubair is one of the most well-acquainted peop of people with Aisha because she was his maternal aunt. It was also narrated by another chain by a Zuri from Urwa, so an independent- Now hold on. Now, no, let me finish, hold on. Let me finish. it's a short quotation. Go ahead, please do. Please okay, do. it was narrated by another chain by a Zuri from Urwa ibn al-Zubair, from Aisha, narrated by okay. Muslim. So it's from Urwa, it's from Hisham's father, hold on. but by a, separate, by a separate narrator. It was also narrated by another chain by Al-Amash, okay, from on. Ibrahim, from Al-Aswad, from Aisha, so a separate narrator from Aisha. It was also narrated oh, no, hold on. by that's another enough. That's chain. Enough. Hold on. You made a false, you made a false claim. No, no, I did it not. Was hold on. Let, let's clarify what you're saying. Another chain. Let's this is the last, this is the last hold one. On. This is the last, this is the let's last. Let's clarify this what you're this saying. This is the last one. It's one sentence. Oh, goodness It was gracious. also narrated via another Let, chain from Muhammad ibn Amr, from Mr. Yahya Mr. ibn Amr. Can you chime in so I can get a word in as well? From Aisha. So we have multiple narrations from Aisha. Okay, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. This isn't David Wood's story time here. So what, what we have here is these hadith from Hisham ibn Urwa, the problem with it is, and you'll find in, in other hadith and other from other scholars, that they say that when he, when he was giving these hadith, that sometimes he, he gave uh, co co uh, contradictory stories about these hadith. And, and this is one of the many reasons why these hadith are rejected, why he was considered unreliable and untrustworthy and fabricated some of the hadith and deemed, deemed unreliable because uh, the fabrication was going on. So it's, that's a fact. So what you're saying is in, in support of my case. Thank you very much. Because what, what, now he's trying to, what he's trying to do is trying to use the saying, it came from Aisha and came from this and came from that. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Uh, Hisham ibn Urwa is the one that said that that happened. Right? And no. again, the scholar, Wrong. hold on, hold on, hold on. Wrong. No, H no. Hisham, it, they're, they're separate, narrated. They're separate isnads uh, that do not include right. Hisham. It was near, near, exactly. Some don't. Some don't include him. Some don't include his father. Some don't include his father, and therefore that proves my point. It, pro it proves my point. So if they include Hisham, uh, he fabricated. If they don't include Hisham, he, he, no. They got it the ones that too? don't include is, the ones that don't include Hisham obviously are coming from his students. But no, the ones no, no, they're not. <laughs> they're completely different as nods, yeah. not through his students. All, how, th so now you're displaying your ignorance on the matter. Every single, every single one, listen closely. No, they don't. Listen, listen closely. No, they every don't. Every single one of the. No, they don't. Hold on, hold on. Let me finish what I'm you saying. You can say it a thousand every times. Every single no, they one don't. of the age of Aisha marital hadith all come from Iraq. No, they all, yes, no, they, they do. No, they don't. Yes. Yeah, you can say, hey, listen, listen. Re read, 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 read the, read the evidence. Read what the scholars say, and they all say that these hadith came from the people of Iraq, meaning Hisham ibn Urwa after he relocated to Iraq and those of his students from Iraq. Uh, let, let, so let, yes, let, there's multiple, again. multiple. they come from multiple sources. Oh. No one's disputing that. Not a person, I've never disputed that, but I am telling you for a fact that all of these hadith come from the original primary source, Hisham ibn Urwa, and those of his students after he relocated to Iraq. That's what all of the scholars say. All right, so um, let, let me read this real quick. Sheikh, uh, Sheikh Abu Ishaq al-Hawani compiled the names of those who followed Urwa ibn al-Zubair, namely, and then he gives a list of the names. He also compiled the names of those who followed Hisham ibn Urwa uh, in narrating this hadith. They were uh, Ibn uh, Shahab al-Zuri uh, and Abu, uh, Abu Hamza al-Maymun, he, he gives the name. Then he, then he named those who narrated it from Hisham ibn Urwa among the scholars of Medina. So there were scholars among Medina who narrated this. He gives a list. Among the people of Mecca, it was narrated by Sufyan ibn Unayna. It was also narrated by, and he gives a list of, of names from other people. Among the people of Basra, it was narrated by Ham uh, what, what Haman ibn Where are you reading that from? What, what is that? What, what Islam Q&A? Islam Q&A. The Islam... The so, <laughs> so, what you'll find... Hold on. We'll, we'll hold listen on, to Joshua Little find? as long as we don't understand anything Joshua Little is saying. No, what, what you'll find... an Islamic scholar's what you'll website, find is, then is, you can't do it. What you'll find... And once again, Dr. Joshua Little with no dog in the fight. Now, now let's clarify something. Let's, let, let's clarify something. The Muslims debate amongst, amongst themselves about this issue. All right? So that proves my point. 
that the, the issue is debatable. Therefore, right. you can't, they, they debate you, all can't kinds of you can't accuse the prophet when the the the, if, the, 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 the the charges against them are debatable. The Muslims debate about themselves. If so a Muslim debate, so if some Muslim, side, if, hold on, hold if two Muslims on. Debate some Muslims right. We can't, we can't lay some some Muslims awesome. right in defense of the idea that she was nine years old and so forth. Some We've Muslims, seen that earlier some today. Muslims say she. she some Muslims, Muslims, Muhammad. Some Muslims write on the contrary, saying no, she had to be anywhere from nine. She could have been as old as twenty-one in in some of some of these works, right? Yeah, if you don't. So have therefore, the evidence is debatable. So you don't accuse someone of of impropriety and wrongdoing when the evidence is clearly debatable. He's proving my case. Thank you. But, and so, depending on what site you go to and who's writing, where the article came from, some are going to be writing in defense that she was nine years old. Some are going to say, oh, no, there's no possible way that she could have been nine years old. All this proves my point. All this proves my case. You don't charge someone with a crime and convict them and send them to the guillotine or put them in the chair because when, when, you, when the evidence is debatable. That's why you look at all the evidence, just like I mentioned, when someone, you got multiple people addressing forensics in a courtroom and they're all saying, oh, there's no way it could have been this person, had to be that person or whatever, they're breaking down DNA and they get different conclusions or whatever it works. They're looking at forensic, you know, whatever, whatever the issue is, you look at the conflicting views of those experts and say, ah, oh, that one's saying this and that one's saying that. That and all right, man, uh, I'm sitting. I'm sitting yeah. in the jury, and there's no possible way I can't. Yeah, uh, I have so, to say, uh, so they're, they're, they're innocent they're, they're, because I can't prove it beyond a reasonable again, doubt. Again, they're over. They're over They're over 200 sources on this, so that's like having uh, 200 witnesses in your case. And, and there's 300 you, you, you to the country. You would just reject them all. Oh, yeah. okay. Give, give me, give me yeah. the three. Give me the 300. I'll, I'll, give, give the, the 200 you just mentioned. Give me. Give, give, give 20 give me, of them. Give me. I bet you can't do it. Kenny, Kenny, what? I bet you can't do it. No, give the 200. Where's the two hundred? No, 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 I can't Go give ahead. 200. I'll, I give, I give you, I give you a couple thousand right now. Let me can give you give twenty? How many can you and, give? And, that and she for was every 21? twenty that you can give, I'll counter it with with. How many references say that can you wasn't. give me that she was twenty-one? Uh, two. What are they? Uh, I'll, I'll have to go to my other notes, but oh, okay. yeah. well, um, I mean, do you have that, everything memorized? I don't have that's everything weird. memorized. Uh, Kenny, let, let me give you a little analogy here. So, so here we are. We're, we're all in a room here. Suppose that James had some concern over security. Suppose there was a threat. Let's stick to the topic. No, 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 no. no this, this, this is the topic. This is the topic. I'm exactly on topic. I don't you'll think see. James you'll, has anything to do see. with Come the topic. Come on, let, let me finish my example. So suppose James was concerned about security, and so suppose he had everyone go through a metal detector walking in there, and there was a pat down, and we all got wanded, and they're really, okay, hurry up. they're really checking everyone to make sure there are no dangers. Suppose we're having this discussion, all of a sudden- What does this have to do with, with this marriage being Let me finish, it's very easy. Yeah, my goodness. Who, who are you yelling so, at? So hang on. If we, How, talk, if, talk we're to me sitting, later. if we're sitting in here, and we've all been searched, and we've all been through a metal detector. Well, all of a sudden, hey, when he was interrupting me, did you, did you holler out like that? And all of Whoever a sudden, that was? Kenny, let me finish, man. Come it's holler a, at me it's later. It's a simple point. If all of a sudden someone pulls out an AK-47, and you say, oh, okay, this guy's got an AK-47. We, we need to get him out of here. What, what does, does that this tell have you? to do with this marriage? It tells you the entire methodology of searching people is screwed up and defective. And for all we know, every last person might have an AK-47 and a bomb because the method is defective. So when your greatest Hadith scholars say, hey, there are hundreds of thousands of stories. We know most of them are made up. And they come up with a methodology. How do we actually get to true stories? And then they come up with the best of the best. This is the best of the best by the guy who was the best of the best. Kenny thinks this guy didn't know what, he, how, to, how to discern a true story from a false story. Because no, but this the is Institute filled, of Islamic Jurisprudence This is filled does. with false stories, not according to me, according to Kenny. And therefore, if this is filled with false stories, how do you believe any of it? That's what Joshua Little concluded. The entire methodology is a joke. Hadith criticism, according to Joshua Little, from an Islamic perspective, I mean, the Islamic version. Remember what I said earlier. A, okay, let, let me chime joke. in. He's been it's rambling. Okay, joke. so naturally. This is an Orthodox Muslim right. claiming that the sources are garbage yeah. and that the best uh, okay. of the best l is nonsense. The, the, the sources are garbage regarding the marital report of that's Aisha. That's not what Joshua yeah, Little says. That's he what says that is general. what he's saying. So naturally, oh according God. to the Institute you of You know you're on record, right? Hold on. Right? Absolutely. You know absolutely. On absolutely. And I'll stand by every word that I've spoken. So. In regards to the principles of, of, of analyzing hadith, uh, David Wood is not uh, one of these people who analyze hadith. He's the one who gives his own interpretation. But what do they say? Naturally, Islam, no, Dr. Joshua Little, rather, he says, naturally, Islamophobes will assert 
that the Muslim acceptance of the authenticity of this hadith causes child marriage. Therefore, by criticizing the Muslims for acceptance of the hadith, Islamophobes claim they're making the world a better place. But he says, if however, the true intention or impulse of the Islamophobe is simply to lash out at Muslims, then this makes more sense. No matter what position the Muslim takes, Islamophobes will find from some pretext to attack them, and this is true for most bigots, and their cited rationales invariably turn out to be pretext, and their real motivation is a deep seething resentment Hatred and discomfort towards the given target group. Now, That's, regarding the principles of hadith, I, I hate to interrupt, okay. but just to stay on track, especially because we have a short Q and A, and then we do we are running a little bit late. This is actually time where we run into the closing statement. Okay, can I can I end just with, with one last really statement? A, Take about do fifteen I get seconds. Into? Like fifteen seconds, okay. and then we got. How authentic is a Sahih Hadith? Imam Ibn, Ibn Al Salah, the renowned Hadith expert, states in the Muqaddimah that just because a Hadith is given the status of being Sahih does not necessi necessitate that it's undeniably Sahih or reliable. However, there remains a possibility that even a Sahih Hadith considered uh, Hadith considered a Sahih may not actually be as such, since a reliable reliable, reliable narrator can also make a mistake. We do have to right. move forward. Okay, I'll, I'll just end with this last sentence. No, no, hold on. That was, okay. but that was. Okay. We we got to jump into the next. This one is okay. four minute closing from David, and then we'll have a four minute closing from Kenny. David, the floor is all yours. All right. Well, uh, putting all of this together, as I said in my opening statement, there are two op there are two options before us. Either Islam's most trusted sources are generally reliable because they did come up with a, a really good methodology, or they aren't. If Islam's most trusted sources are generally reliable, if they had a good methodology, then Muhammad definitely had sex with a nine-year-old girl. Because yes, you can say, ah, just because one thing is labeled Sahih, that doesn't mean it's a, uh, it's com it, there could be other reasons for doubting it. True, when you have dozens and dozens of them spread across Islam's most trusted sources that meet the requirements of various Hadith scholars and, and, the, Sira, and the Sira scholars and so on, and, to the point where Ibn Kathir, considered by many to be the, the, one of the greatest Muslim scholars of all time, says that no one disputes this. And Kenny's going, oh, it's dispute. It's a matter of dispute. It's a, it's a, yeah, it's a matter of dispute among Muslims who are embarrassed by this. Um, but yeah, so if, if either they're generally reliable, if they are, then, I mean, this is as good as gold. You rarely find anything in Islam that you have this much evidence for. So if this isn't good enough, then great. Because we have the other alternative, which is that even their best scholars and their best sources are unreliable. They're unreliable. That a person could just make something up and it would be spread by, it would spread to dozens, even hundreds of sources. So if, if these are generally reliable, then you got a problem because your prophet suffered from what what's would now be called non-exclusive pedophilic disorder. Not a good moral example. Um, or we just don't know much about Muhammad. We can't trust the best of the best. And that means we don't know much about Muhammad and we don't know much about the Quran because much of the Quran can't even be understood without appealing to the historical background found in other sources. So if we can't trust the sources, we, we wow, we don't even understand the Quran. We don't even know much about the, the formation of the Quran and so on. Uh, so what do we what do we really have here? We have uh, modern Muslims <laughs> appealing to academics who, again, read read read. Just start off. His first chapter is on general methodology. He doesn't even get into the issue. He doesn't even get in. He doesn't even start going through them. This is general methodology. And just to quote it once again, he says, regardless. Skepticism obtains regarding Hadith, capital H. That means the entire corpus. Skepticism obtains regarding Hadith as it stands. Any given Hadith, Sahih or otherwise, should be presumed to be inauthentic or unreliable until the contrary can be demonstrated. He's saying these, these are fraught with so many problems, and he goes through a bunch of them over and over and over again. These sources are so filled with problems with uh, fabrication, interpolation, and so on. We have to presume these sources uh, guilty until proven innocent. If you want to make a case for any specific hadith, you have to make a specific case for that hadith. You can't just say, well, it's, it's, it's sahih. He rejects that. Uh, so, 
Kenny, uh, you're clear, I have to say you're, you're clearly bothered by what your sources say about Muhammad's marriage to Aisha. Um, if you're so bothered by it that you're willing to throw out uh, your greatest historians and your greatest scholars, if you're willing to throw them under the bus, um, if it bothers you that much, th there's an easier way. <laughs> there's an easier way out of this. You can just reject Islam. If you're rejecting all the sources and, and, you, and they can't come up with a reliable way of doing things, then just leave Islam. It's that simple. Your sources don't work. If your sources don't work, then I would uh, close with the advice of my friend, the apostate prophet, stay away from Islam. We'll kick it over to Kenny for a four minute closing as well. Kenny, the floor is all yours. All right, thank you. So Imam, Imam Ibn al-Salah, the renowned Hadith expert, states in his Muqaddimah that just because a Hadith is given the status of being Sahih, meaning reliable, it does not necessitate that in actual fact it is undeniably Sahih or reliable. It merely means that from a technical aspect in terms of collecting the hadith, the, sahih is hi, is sahih, the hadith is sahih and therefore will most likely be sahih in actual terms as well. But he says, however, there remains the possibility that even a hadith considered as sahih may not actually be as such. There, since a reliable narrator such as Hisham ibn Urwa can also make a mistake or they may be outright lying or have a, have a sloppiness in tr a train of, uh, chain of transmission. Said, but they say, but the possibility is not given any credit unless there are indications and strong proofs elsewhere, such as the hadith opposing a clear Quranic verse or the more authentic hadith suggesting that a mistake may have been made by a narrator of that Sahih hadith. And if such strong proofs are found, it's perfectly acceptable not to act upon or accept that Sahih hadith. So in the previous debate, I mentioned works by numerous scholars, Muslim and non-Muslim alike, who all upon different uh, ages for Aisha, potential ages from, yes, nine to as old as 21. They all had different ages for her. And again, I didn't come up with those numbers. The scholars and historians did. Um, also mentioned that, so the, the hadith in question did come from Hisham ibn Urwa as the original primary source, as well as those from of his students um, that were all from the region of Iraq, the Al-Shafi school of thought. And also I mentioned that even if, if, if Aisha was nine years old, what does the word a consummation and cohabitation uh, mean? Does, so, meaning, does a, by example, in Christianity, when the preacher says, I now pronounce you man and wife, is the, is the marriage ethical and valid even before sex has taken place? The prophet himself, peace be upon him, he had two wives that he lived together with and cohabited with in ethical marriages, and they never had sex. Is it at all possible in the minds of people out there who have made their minds up, it, at, at all possible, that the prophet, peace be upon him, this is not a reach. This is just using basic logic and reason and simple decency, being honest within yourself. Is it at all possible that the prophet could have cohabited with Aisha in a quote unquote consummated and valid and ethical marriage and waited until she was actually physically and, mo and mentally and emotionally capable of engaging in sexual activity? Well, sure he could. Deals are consummated, no, no sex is required. Merit, the prophet lived with other wives that he never had sexual relations with. Those, those marriages were considered consummated in his own words that upon cohabitation with these wives, uh, and I see the bicker, the little snickers up in the front, uh, but the, uh, upon cohabitation with these wives, that these scholars were, uh, I mean, th these wives were in ethical marriages with the prophet and cohabiting with him in consummated marriages without sex. The word consummation does not only mean sexual intercourse. Look it up. It means binding, establishing, forging, uh, creating, uh, coming to an agreement. One, one, one example was they, the, the uh, company consummated its deal to buy a smaller firm. So the deal is consummated. It's established. It's put in place. Could he have not lived with a nine-year-old Aisha if, in fact, she was nine years old, even though the evidence is quite to the contrary. Um, could he have done that and it be deemed ethical? Cohabiting with her in a quote unquote, religiously valid and ethical marriage, consummated marriage, based on the very definition of the word itself and the definition of the word in the Arabic, banabiha, which means to build, establish, or begin, has nothing to do with sexual intercourse. That's why none of the hadith in question say, the prophet had sex with me when I was nine years old. None of them say that. Thank you very much, Kenny, for that closing statement. We'll head into the Q&A. If you have questions, folks, please come on up this aisle way.
All right, we're ready for the first one. Do you want me to get the stream going? Yes. And same rules as last time. Please just state your question. Do not make it a statement of length. Uh, thank you, David and Kenny. Uh, this is a question for uh, for Kenny, but both can respond. <coughs> So, um, Kenny, you were saying something along the lines that uh, we shouldn't, uh, uh, if, if there's debate on something, we shouldn't accuse uh, uh, that person of, uh, or something of, of being false. But um, why don't we, it seems like a double standard, how, why don't we apply this when it comes to uh, textual criticism in uh, Christian scholarship? Because in order for Islam to be true, uh, uh, Christianity has to be corrupted. So why don't we see that? that same uh, generosity when it comes to, uh, you know, to being charitable to the uh, conservative Christian scholarship? Uh, thank you very much for your question. So to, to answer your question, so the Bible, by example, is words according to men. Written, the Bible is words according to men. None of them say that, that it came from directly from the Creator. It's, it's the Matthew, you know, book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John according to these anonymous authors and so forth. Uh, and so, as Muslims, we, you know, we accept those things within the Bible that are consistent with the true monotheistic message of the Quran, meaning when Jesus, peace be upon him, is recorded as saying, if, he, if we believe that he said these, and I believe this is something he would say, Hear, O Israel, our Lord, our God is, is one, repeating the words of Moses in Deuteronomy and so forth, peace be upon, be upon them both, then we accept that as Muslims. So we, we reject those things that are inconsistent with the Quran and accept those things that are consistent. The same thing applies to the Hadith. And so uh, we apply the same standards. If it's, if it's a hadith that seems questionable, you know, we shouldn't get involved in a groupthink mentality just because it's the popular thing to do. We should be th thinking independently and say, does that really make sense? Does it coincide with, with the message of, message of Islam? In Islam, it is a requirement that the Muslim does not oppress anyone, right? You're not supposed to oppress anyone. People make mistakes. But nevertheless, you know, in regards to women in particular, uh, uh, when a, when a woman accepts marriage, by example, she has to be willing to, to accept that husband. And there has to be a, you know, a, a dowry paid and all that. And so it's a, um, that's part of the requirement. You can't just oppress someone and think that a, a man's going to get on top of a little girl uh, and, and oppress her because that would be an absolute oppression. And we wouldn't assume that a nine-year-old child is willing to engage in, in, in a sexual intercourse with a grown man. I just, you know, it would, that just doesn't seem feasible. So when these hadith pop up and you th think about that, you say, that doesn't, that's not, that's inconsistent with, one, the message of, of Islam, period, uh, message again, uh, the, the words of, uh, of the Prophet himself, who uh, uplifted the status of women, if you study the history of the Prophet, peace be upon him, and um, bringing, bringing uh, the status of women up from being um, sex slaves in, in early Arabia uh, to becoming, uh, to where they can have their own property and have, you know, that's why they're given a dowry and they're giving, given inheritance and the men is, are, respect, are expected to pay for, for everything for their wives and so forth. Um, it uplifts the status of women. So to answer your question, I know I went around the block with it a little bit, but the point being that um, when we see these things are inconsistent, we have the right to reject them. Uh, matter of fact, the, the last sentence that I read a second ago, if strong proofs are found, it's perfectly acceptable not to act upon or accept that particular Sahih Hadith. Now that's the Institute of Islamic Jurisprudence saying that. That's not me saying that, but my, my common sense tells me that if this seems kind of odd and strange, I just move past it. Same thing with, with things that I see in the Bible that I disagree with. I just move past it. You know, and so uh, um, in, in my mind, we should have a balance there. It should be, a, a, um, you know, put things on equal scales and, and be, be honest about whatever, whatever information we're looking at. Sure, go ahead. I'm sorry. Sure. Uh, let, me, let me, quick comment. Because uh, he, did, he, did, he, did, he did say both of us could respond. I just want to say, uh, um, in spite of our other disagreements, I do like Kenny's sense of, Western individualism where he is not bound by what's in all of these sources and that he can freely just, I don't like that and therefore I can, uh, I can, I can toss all this out. I actually like that. All right. 
All right. Uh, hey, Kenny, I wanted to say sorry because I said no over there. The reason is he's trying to hey, give me the... that was you? Hold on. Shame yeah. on you. What's up? I know. So I, I was trying to say that, you know, like the Hisham, yes, he's from Iraq, like when he's narrating, but he was giving you the from Mecca and also Medina. But anyway, that's not my question. Just want to say sorry. Um, so you said uh, a couple of things uh, while you were talking. You said 65.4, uh, uh, it says, min nisaikum, right, that from your woman. Yeah. If you go to 49, it gives the, it says, uh, and recall when we saved you uh, from the people of Fora who afflicted you with the war storm and slaughtering your newborn sons and keeping your females alive. And in that, there was a great trial from your Lord, right? So actually, uh, the keeping your females alive, it also you word the Nisa'ikum, like the same Nisa is used. Um, and uh, it gives the Exodus uh, 15, um, uh, I mean 1, uh, 15, 16, where the, uh, the, the four is killing the babies of the Israel, Israelites, right? Uh, keeping the daughters alive. So, and I can, I can give you more, uh, 249, 4127, 7141, 146. So anyway, so, okay, sorry guys, sorry, just wanted to. So you said, you said in the Hadith, right, Bana uh, Biha, uh, uh, that means uh, uh, consummated, it just means like the contracted, right? That's what you said, right? It means to build, to establish, okay. to forge. The same thing, same thing that you find in the biblical Hebrew, right. it same means word. Entered into her, it means into her, uh, Sunan Nisa, uh, Sunan An Nisa 3378 actually the, what, uses the word, the hala, which actually means the synonym word that means entered on her. And then another one, Sahih Bukhari. Okay. What? Okay. The question is, why are you lying? <laughs> why am I lying? Yeah. So that's, that's pretty rude, but to say the least, I'm not really lying, I haven't lied about anything, but to, to address your point. So, uh, yes, so Bana Biha means to establish with her. No problem with that. Do husbands and wives establish homes together all the time? Bana Biha, why did he, so to build and establish with her. So he established a, if, if, if in fact she was nine years old, again, the, the, the evidence is contrary, but Bana Biha, to establish with her. The word ba, it's the same in the, in the biblical Hebrew. Hebrew is a sister language of, of the Arabic, and you can look it up yourself, and you'll find that it means to build, to establish, to begin, or forge in the biblical Hebrew. So it's the same word. And, and so, Banabiha, he established a home with her if, in fact, she was nine years old. Note that some of the hadith are translated in the hadith in English as consummated sometimes. And as I mentioned in the two hadith that he brought up in his recent video that I discussed earlier, they use the word cohabitation because these words are synonymous with one another. They're semantically the same and they mean the same thing. Basically, you establish and enter the home. And I mentioned about five or six different sources scholarly sources, early Muslim sources, that said the word Banabiha means to build and establish and to begin and establish a home with the, with the bride, with Aisha. All right, thank you. Next question now. D David, do you agree with Kenny on Surah 65.4? Um, no. Uh, so, uh, I, I may have missed something. It sounded, it sounded like he, you were saying that this applies to women. Um, and that the verse is, a, is applying to women, uh, th that's, that's actually the problem, not the solution. Uh, that everyone is, lumped, everyone is lumped together. In fact, uh, I, I had in Bukhari, so right before, right before Bukhari, right before Bukhari uh, gives his chapter heading, giving one's young children in marriage is permissible by virtue of the statement of Allah. And he quotes Surah 65, verse 4. And uh, then he quotes Muhammad as an example of someone who had sex with a prepubescent girl. Uh, the chapter heading right before it was the hadith I quoted uh, before I quoted that one, which is um, about Muhammad having a dream about Aisha and then uncovering her in the dream. And the chapter heading there is, it is permissible to look at a woman, at a woman before marrying her. So it's calling, and she's a six-year-old at that time, and it's calling her a woman. She's a six-year-old and it's calling her a woman, but as far as the understanding of Surah 65, four, this is this is what I what I meant by uh, saying that you know I can respect Kenny going against the grain on some things because uh, as far as the, the historical back the historical background of the verse is Muhammad. What about girls who are too young to have a monthly menstrual cycle? What about girls who haven't reached puberty? What about them? That's the that's the uh, that's the historical background according to Ibn Kathir, uh, Al Wahidi, and Azbab Al Nazul. That's uh, what Al Razi said. 
Ibn Kathir says that. So, uh, and then if you look at the, the relevant phrase, the relevant phrase in question, um, that those who, those who haven't reached, uh, reached menstruation, you can, you can just go down the list of Muslim commentators. Again, Ibn Abbas says uh, it refers to those who do not have menstruation because they are too young. Qatada ibn Diyana says it refers to those who have not yet menstruated. Al-Sudi says it refers to young girls. Tabari says it refers to girls who do not menstruate because they are too young. Bukhari says, I know, I'll take a couple seconds. Bukhari says it refers to, refers to girls before puberty. Mukatil says it refers to young girls who did not menstruate yet. Ibn Kathir, we've read the two Jalal. Zamakshri says it refers to the young ones. Al-Tabarasi says it refers to those who didn't reach puberty yet. Kortami says it refers to the young. There are only two possibilities here, ladies and gentlemen. Either, two, either this verse is about having sex with prepubescent girls, or it's so hopelessly unclear and so terribly worded that every great Muslim scholar for 14 centuries concluded that it's talking about sex with prepubescent girls. All and right. practically let, speaking, let, let those, are, those are equally let, as bad. Let me respond okay, to Okay, you can, but then I get to respond to everyone who asks you a question. Okay. So, so, so when he says that every single Muslim scholar uh, agrees that with what he said, no, they didn't don't. say that. You just said that. I said lesson. every great anyway, scholar. Let, 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 me, let me keep it. You said every great scholar, every great scholar. says that it means what you just said. And I, and I read other scholars about 65.4 in particular who said something different. Therefore, it proves my case. So if one scholar, the, this group of scholars is saying this, that group of scholars is saying that, it proves my case. But the reality of it is the verses themselves, the chapter itself is called divorce in English. It's called divorce. Men and women get divorced. The Arabic words used in particular, it says for those women, minas min nisa'ikum, women, those women, and wale'i, and for those who. It doesn't say the words little girl, young child, none of that is in those verses of the Quran. So what someone interprets of it is their opinion. And there's other scholars who have a different opinion. And the words wale'i simply means for those who. It doesn't say for those little girls who. Those little children who, it's wale'i, for those women who, min nisa'ikam, Allahu Akbar. So my question is for, uh, my question is for Kenny. And uh, this, this is, I'm, I'm gonna use an analogy in my question, but it's related to the quotations that were cited by both you and David uh, in regards to the Joshua Little, Little article. Um, so just by way of analogy, in, in Hinduism, there is a genre of, of scripture called Purana. The word Purana in Sanskrit means ancient. It means like a record of things that came before. Now, if I, in the field of religious studies, were to write a paper, and in the introduction of my paper, I said, generally speaking, Puranic literature is historically unreliable. And then I go on to say, now, and the title of my paper is The Historical Unreliability of the Pavishya Puran, specifically. And, but in my introduction, I begin by saying, generally speaking, Puranic literature is historically unreliable. Now let me talk about the Pavishya Puran and why I think it is specifically un historically unreliable. What would you think I meant in my introduction? Uh, yeah, I'm, not, I'm not entirely sure I understand your question, but I, uh, I, I would now, during, during my opening statement, I, I mentioned the principles of hadith uh, acceptance and rejection uh, from the Is Institute of Islamic Jurisprudence. And so, uh, le le so, in summary, so we'll apply this, what you just mentioned, if I understand the question right, I'm not sure that I do, but we'll apply that to what I believe your, your question is addressing. So in regards to, so let's say we're now we're shifting, we're using the same principles in regard to in, in, in Islam. So principle number four that I mentioned. Principle number four. Uh, it says a sahih or reliable hadith may be considered da'if or unreliable in later times. And so it says it's, at times it's possible that an earlier scholar finds a particular hadith completely authentic when it reaches him through the sahaba, meaning the earliest people, the, the, prophet, the, the companions of the prophet and the tabi'un, the students of those companions. Um, and those succeeding them. However, they say, a weakness in the chain of narration, meaning the oral tradition, the what's passed on from one group, 
through generation through generation through generation to another, uh, that a weakness in the chain of narration could have appeared as it progresses past that imam or that particular group, however you want to look at it. But they say in such an instance, it would be wrong to accuse the earlier imam of using a weak hadith, and so going with what they knew at the time. However, they say, if it was perceivably reliable or sahih in his time, but in, in unreliable later on. Um, they say, therefore, a hadith that which was regarded as da'if in Imam Bukhari's time, by example, uh, was not necessarily as such. So just because they, they might have labeled it sahih, but didn't necessarily mean that it was, because they say, um, uh, for example, was not necessarily such, and, and so what does that mean? It means principle number five, how, how authentic is a sahih hadith? It says, Imam Ibn al-Salah, the renowned hadith expert, said in his muqaddimah, in his findings, that just because a, a hadith is given the, stahi, the status of being sahih or reliable does not nece necessitate that in actual fact it is undeniably sahih or reliable. It just means uh, that in regards to collecting the hadith, that it was reliable. Meaning at the, at the time, before the critical analysis was engaged, that that's what they believed and that's what they passed on and it was an ongoing repeating the same stories over and over and over again and uh, and so that's that's how it spread so I'll summarize with that I'm not sure if I totally understood your question yeah, I, I don't, but I okay I that's fine okay. thank you all right salamu alaikum wa alaikum salam thank you for both for a, a very nice debate and I appreciate you coming here and everything else yeah, alhamdulillah um, I have a I have a question um, Daniel, Daniel was here the, at the debate with Mike. He was defending the, uh, the Prophet Muhammad, and he admitted he didn't have a problem with him marrying a nine-year-old. And he was, instead of texting and instead of this, I think he made it, he gave us the impression that a 50-year-old man marrying a nine-year-old girl is, is the best thing that could have ever happened to that girl. Now, from your perspective, you're having a problem and you're saying, no, it's not true. This is just a hadith. We don't know if it's true. You cannot accuse somebody who is uh, holy or nice with an act like this. So what my question to you, Mr. Kenny, if it was true for argument's sake, let's say it was true, these hadith were true, would you still accept the Prophet Muhammad as a prophet, because even if he was a 54-year-old man who committed this act? Who married a nine-year-old? Yeah. Would you still, if even if it was true, let's say for argument's sake, yeah. would you still, or you would, or you would denounce him as a prophet? No, I would, wouldn't denounce him as a prophet. But I've, I've addressed that in the previous debate as well. Thank you for your question. So I have no problem if, in fact, the prophet peace be upon him married Aisha and and cohabited with her, as the hadith say, uh, in a valid and ethical consummated marriage, and she was nine years old. Uh, because, as I mentioned, he lived and cohabited with other wives that he didn't have sex with, um, in, in valid, consummated, and ethical marriages. And I don't believe that the Prophet, peace be upon him, would have caused her any oppression because the, the Quran itself speaks against that. It re, matter of fact, it, re, it, it speaks about, uh, in one surah, it's going to take too long to get into it, but one surah addressing the um, 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 orphans and so forth about giving them their, their justice and their rights and making sure that you don't don't steal from them anything uh, and when they become of age and become sure enough then you give them what's due to them and so you would think that if the Quran is mentioning the Prophet of Allah peace be upon him is revealing these verses from Allah then you would assume that the Prophet himself would not uh, in, would not impede against that by oppressing a little girl by having sex with her uh, before she was able to do so. With that being said, you know, uh, I believe that the prophet, it is possible, I do believe that it's possible, that the prophet, um, even though I do believe these hadith were, were, were uh, they're unreliable, uh, but I believe if it was possible, like you mentioned, and, and it did occur, that the prophet would not have oppressed her in any way. That he would have waited until she was not only physically ready, as we've seen that Daniel gave a strong case about uh, the early age of, of uh, girls menstruating and so forth and developing, but also on top of that she would have had to be mentally and emotionally ready to engage in sexual activity. And I believe the Prophet of Allah, uh, peace be upon him, would have waited until she was ready for that. 
And that's why I said, let's say for the sake of argument that she was nine years old. What are these words? You know, what is the word Banabiha co cohabitation used in the Hadith and the word consummation uh, used in the, in the English? What do these words mean? It means that they're cohabiting with one another in a valid ethical marriage that is consummated, that it's established, it's been, it's, it's, uh, it's been put in place. It's been put in place. Um, my question is for Mr. David Wood. Um, although I do believe you have done a brilliant job at defending your position as well as simultaneously proving all of Kenny's points as he stated, um, I would like to ask, um, if we were to take Kenny's position, which I interpret it to be that um, because the information that was presented in Al-Bukhari and other hadith has been challenged that we should not accept it, are there things aside from that that would lead us to believe that the marriage between Aisha and the Prophet Muhammad are unethical? Uh, wait, what, what, what was that? What was that I'm about? sorry if I trailed off at the end. Are there other reasons to believe outside of the age if we took the position that he has that we should not come to a conclusion on, which I believe that's what he was saying, we should not come to a conclusion on the age of Aisha oh. because uh, the information yeah, I mean, has I, been debated? I, again, this, this, this makes, uh, you, somehow this makes Kenny happy, but yeah, they're, they're, they're again, two main possibilities here. So um, if you, it, it's basically, you did have a lot of false hadiths um, circulating and so on. And this became such a problem that they said, we need to come up with a methodology to distinguish true hadiths from false hadiths. And so the methodology that they came up with um, was, was this, you know, looking at the asnad and making sure that nothing violates the Quran. They, they, they had a collection of, but the, the, um, the hadith scholars came up with their methods and then they, put together what they considered the most reliable hadiths. Out of, out of hundreds of thousands, they came up with you know, several thousand that they thought were, were best and, and strongest. So these are the sources that say, over and over again, spread, spread throughout these, that Aisha was six or seven when the proposal uh, was made, and then uh, nine when the marriage was consummated. As far as the ethics, whether Muhammad's marriage with Aisha was ethical, we, we ha all we've got to go on is these sources. That's it. So if these sources, if these sources are what, like something like Joshua Little, what, if, if these sources are what Joshua Little thinks they are, namely just piles, piles of, of garbage that you have to really, really struggle to root through to find anything of value, and if these are being crafted in an atmosphere where people are just, they feel free for any dispute to make up hadiths and then make up perfectly sound isnads and then to pass them around, and then they mutate over time and they keep being embellished and so on. If these are generally unreliable, then it's not that we can say, no, Muhammad's marriage is fine. We have no, we have no idea. We, we, just, we just have no concept. So in that sense, so I would agree, if, if, if that, for anyone who agrees with that idea, namely that these sources are, are unreliable, flawed, uh, filled with fabrications, interpolations, and so on, if someone agrees with that, then I say, you can't say that the marriage was ethical, you just can't say anything about it, we don't know. This is all we have to go on. So yeah, it's either, it's either a problem or we, we, we have no idea, and that depends on the methodology. And, and so it's, it's general, General Islamic methodology would accept the validity of these hadiths, and so you'd have the problem. But you can go to Western academics who say, we don't trust that stuff, and you can use that to get out of it, but you got, again, you gotta pay the toll on that one. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, yeah, uh, my question is for Kenny. So, you know, in Islam, Muhammad is, you know, the most revered person, the most important person, you know, blessed by God, and he's the example for all mankind uh, going forward from his time into the future. So, why is it then that these devout Muslims are so comfortable making up so many stories about him? Hmm. That's, that, that's a great question. Thank you very, very much for that. So, in regards to the Hadith, uh, the Prophet himself, peace be upon him, he rejected writing down uh, things about him other than the Quran. There's a hadith that, that mentioned this specifically. Um, and the matter of fact, he said that anyone who writes anything about him other than the Quran should erase it. 
because he knew this type of conflict would occur. Allah Akbar. The, uh, he's a prophet of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, and he he has uh, had wisdom enough to know that there would be problems amongst the Muslims themselves. These hadith have caused great conflict amongst the Muslims. Uh, it, it existed in the very beginning. They began being being fabricated and spread because one group was riding against another. And just like pl playing political games, that's why Dr. Joshua Lino and his findings and so forth, and Muhammad Haikal uh, many, many years earlier said the same thing, that they were riding in a, uh, for political reasons, that one group was trying to outdo the other group. And so they fabricated, they basically did what human beings do. People engage in politics, people tell lies. You know, humans are humans. It doesn't mean that the, the Muslims are, are infallible any more than the, the Christians are infallible and, and vice versa and, and so forth. People are going to be people. Uh, but the, the hadith in particular about the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, what he said in particular uh, are, are the main hadith that Muslims should live and, and, and base their opinions on. Not the hadith that are associated with something that someone, um, someone else said and, and so forth. And, and, it's, it's what the prophet himself said and what, how he lived by, by his example uh, that, that's most important. And so if you are involved in a groupthink mentality and you're a Muslim who uh, just totally refutes the idea that Sahih Hadith have any fallibility to them, you need to do a whole lot of study. And I mean no offense to my Muslim brothers, matter of fact, Eid Mubarak uh, in saying that. But if you're also, if you're involved in a groupthink mentality and you're a non-Muslim who's determined that the Prophet has done some type of wrongdoing just because it's a popular thing to believe amongst the people that you associate with, you're being intellectually dishonest. You should read and do research for yourself and then draw your conclusion. One more question. Oh, oh. Our final question for the night. Oh, one, one second, I just wanted to add something since we uh, agreed that there could be a response. Uh, uh, here, 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 I actually agree with you, and I just did, I did want to point out, um, Joshua Little's dissertation is filled with, uh, with brilliant anal analysis. This is like cutting edge hadith studies and so on, so I, I encourage people to read it. Lots of important information there, but, but the relevant part of that, of that question um, is something that should give rise to uh, the, the issues you know, concerning not just blindly accepting things that Kenny pointed out, because the, the, the relevant part of that question was, why did so many Muslims feel comfortable inventing stories and narrations and so on, such that you had hundreds of thousands of them before you even narrow it down to these, and even these are, are contain um, problematic passages that, according to Joshua Little, uh, very little of this probably goes back to um, Muhammad. So it's, it's, if people are that comfortable just fabricating massive amounts of content, notice the conclusion, the conclusion is not, Pick what you like. The conclusion is you can't, you can't trust this stuff. And so notice one more thing. These are the same people, that, the, the early Muslim community, these are the same people protecting the Quran. We'll go to the last question. Kenny, do you think that um, our court system should try to charge, prosecute, or convict people for crimes when the accused is willing to defend themselves? Or should they just not do that because the matter is up for debate? No, I think uh, a reasonable person would look at all the evidence that's presented and then draw an honest conclusion from it. So you don't, if you engage in confirmation bias and decide with the, the, the information that coincides with what you already believe in your mind is made up, it's always going to be made up. But if you're willing to step outside of the box and have no dog in the fight and uh, look at all the evidence presented, even if it might be difficult for you to, to, to ponder and, and accept, um, we should be willing to do that as honest and intellectual in, in individuals who are, you know, um, are willing to, to look at the scales balanced and, and uh, make a, a judgment based on what you have determined. Uh, what, what you have, you know, it, it, basically what he just said a second ago proved my case again, that, um, you know, there's one, one of two possibilities that either he's saying that either it did happen or we just don't know because the information is unreliable. Well, thank you. You've proven my case for the third time today. Uh, Allah Akbar. It's, so the, the point being, is the marriage ethical? How do you accuse someone when the information used against them is debatable? And we're talking about specific hadith 
that are related to the marital age of Aisha. May Allah be pleased with her. Um, that came from Hisham ibn Urwa and his students, primarily of the Al Shafi school of thought that originated in Iraq. Thank you very much. Let's give a round of applause to our speakers. Thank you very much, gentlemen. It's been a true pleasure to have you.